If everybody could uh, get a seat. And before I turn it over to the executive director for the executive director's report, I did want to acknowledge that um, we're very fortunate to have uh, two legislative committees joining us today. We have Senator Lyons in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee and Representative Lippert in the House Health Care Committee. And um, we're very happy to see you. We know that this is a very busy week as you approach town meeting, but uh, thank you for uh, attending. Um, Susan, the Executive Director's yes. Report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so welcome and uh, thank you everyone for attending the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. Um, just a few words about today's meeting. I'm really excited to hear from our panel um, and hear the, re the reports from the field on the all-payer model. Um, the all-payer model, as many of you know, was signed at the end of 2016 and we're well into the second year of this model and um, I think it's going to be interesting to hear from the frontline workers, the providers, the communities on the work that they're doing, um, their successes and perhaps some of their challenges. And here at the board, as many of you know, we do our regulatory, statutory work uh, every week, but because we have this open public meeting space, this is a great opportunity to have an educational panel such as this. And uh, I, for one, am very excited to hear uh, from our panelists. And I know uh, Board Member Holmes and Chair Mullen will uh, set that up after I turn this back to them. Um, I do have a couple of announcements. Number one, uh, Gifford Medical Center has requested a, an amendment on their budget. I want to make sure I get this language right for my general counsel here. Um, so that information has been submitted to the board. The staff recommendation on the request will be uh, posted on our website by March 7th. And the board will be hearing from Gifford on March 13th. Uh, that meeting is going to start at 9 a.m. And I would uh, just put out there, if folks have any public comments on that material when it is posted, we would welcome that. There will be a potential vote scheduled for March 13th. Uh, the other announcement and update I have for the public is that on Monday of this week, we held a, um, an advisory committee meeting. And this was a newly formed advisory. We over the last six or seven months have been looking at reimagining the advisory committee meeting, the advisory committee, and we held our uh, first meeting of the newly formed group on Monday. It was an introductory meeting, but we were very impressed with uh, the broad um, and deep knowledge that these members have, and we are looking forward to working with them and being advised by them. Um, our meeting schedule for the advisory committee is scheduled, is posted on our website, and I'd encourage folks to take a look at the members. They're, they're quite impressive. And I think that's all I have to announce. Oh, one more important announcement. Next week, we do not have a board meeting. It is town meeting week. I see smiling faces. So um, just wanted to announce that as well. And thank you. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. Thank you, Susan. So I'm going to quickly turn it over to uh, Dr. Jessica Holmes, who has put together this panel. Um, I know that the legislators are on a short uh, period of time, so I want to leave as much time for the, to hear from the panelists as possible for them. So Dr. Holmes, thank you for putting this together, and it's all yours. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Chair Mullen. Uh, and a sincere thank you to all of you who are taking the time to spend with us today. Uh, I know all of you have busy days, and particularly I know panelists who have prepared some some stories to share today uh, for taking the time out. Your insights will undoubtedly be invaluable. And I wanted to set the, the table of the goal of today is to enhance the board's and the public's understanding of the all payer model uh, by sharing real human stories about how the delivery system is changing on the ground. As we all know, Vermont is on the cutting edge of healthcare reform. Policymakers from around the country have their eyes <coughs> on Vermont as we transition from a fee-for-service reimbursement system 
that basically rewards volume and not quality towards a value-based payment system, a reimbursement system that is rewarding quality, care coordination, primary prevention, and population health. And as we've said many times at our board meetings, innovation, disruption, and full-scale change in how we pay for and deliver care will take time. So as Susan said, we're in year two of a five-year model. We need patients, a lot of patients. But as the incentives in the system change, so should the allocation of resources. So seeing changes in resource allocation and how care is delivered will tell us that we're on the right path. So we should start to see the system reallocating resources to interventions that have the greatest impact on population health. The shift of resources towards the most cost-effective services which may not always be medical care. In some instances, that may be social services. And we should start to see the system changing how care is coordinated and how care is integrated across the system. And we should start to see the use of big data, now that technology allows that, to help focus our resources on the most vulnerable in monitors. So the board recognizes that many communities are already making these significant changes and we want to learn more. So we put together this incredible panel, I think, to help share with us what's happening on the ground. So we have Dr. Stephen Leffler, who is the Chief Population Health and Quality Officer at the UVM Health Network. We have, to, we have Dr. Joe Haddock, who is an independent practitioner in family medicine at the Thomas Chittenden Health Center. Carla Kamel, who is the Community Care Coordinator at Mount Escutney Hospital. And Jill Lord, an RN, who is the Director of Community Health at Mount Escutney as well. Dr. Carrie Wolfman, who is the Chief Medical Officer at Porter and Allison Wurst, who's the Director of Population Health and Care Management at Porter Medical Center. Judy Peterson, President and CEO of Home Health and Hospice in Chittenden County. Dr. Elizabeth Fontaine, uh, who is a Lifestyle Medicine Practitioner at Northwestern, and Dr. Judy Fingergut, who is a Family Medicine Practitioner at Northwestern as well. So I'm gonna kick us off with a few questions. I'm hoping for a casual conversation. It's hard to have a casual conversation when we have you know, lights, cameras, and action here. <laughs> but as casual as we can possibly be, really, I asked for no presentations because I really wanted this to be a storytelling session about patients. I really wanted the focus here to be about what is happening to patients, what is happening to Vermonters. So with such a large panel, I'll ask a few questions. Don't feel like you have to answer every question. There's enough people up there that I'm sure the questions will be answered um, by some subset. Then we'll open it up to the board for some uh, follow-up questions, and then finally we reserve some time for public comment to the extent that people want to share their experiences or uh, their perspectives. So with that, everybody ready? We're good to go? All right. So my first question involves this movement from fee-for-service. So how has the movement from fee-for-service to fixed payment changed how you deliver care in your communities? Are there examples of increased investment in particular services or personnel as a result of this transition to value-based fixed payment? Any increased emphasis on primary care or social determinants of health? Those are the kinds of uh, investments we'd like to see this model create. So hopefully you can share some stories about that. But I don't know who wants to go first. Okay, right. <laughs> perfect. You can go first. Okay. Um, good morning, and thank you to the Green Mountain um, Care Board for inviting me to share um, a success story in services that we've invested in primary care at Northwestern Medical Center. So I'm going to spend a few minutes sharing with you a success story of our care coordination services um, at our primary care site. Um, I'm a family physician, and back in November of 2017, I had the pleasure of meeting patient WD. He came to me as a new patient um, after his longtime physician retired in the community and was establishing care at our center. Right away, he told me he is a diabetic, and he apologized for the fact that he would not be able to give me a good history because his wife is usually the historian but wasn't present at the visit. I went ahead and checked his A1C. For those that are not familiar, the A1C is how we measure how well-controlled a diabetic is. A well-controlled diabetic is someone with an A1C of less than 7%. His in the office was 11.5%, and that's significantly high. A very uncontrolled diabetic. I asked him, what meds are you taking? He tells me he's taking, he's supposed to be taking a medication called metformin, but can't take it because it upsets his stomach. And he's taking a second pill, doesn't know the name. I asked my medical assistant to please call the pharmacy so we can get some more information. And the only medication the pharmacy had on file for him was the metformin, the one that he's not taking. The second pill was not on that list. 
So I could not do much for him at that visit. I asked him to please have some lab work done, bring in all his medication bottles, and I would see him back in two weeks. He comes back in two weeks, his lab work wasn't done, didn't bring his medications in. I ask him, how are your sugars at home? Are you checking them? He's like, I no longer check my blood sugars. I don't have a machine. Then he informs me at this visit and apologizes again that his short-term memory isn't really good because he had a cerebral aneurysm rupture a few years ago and that affects his short-term memory. So I discussed with him how I think we should proceed with his treatment, and given that I needed to keep his treatment simplified and avoid a lot of medications, um, we decided that insulin would be his best choice. So I wrote out prescriptions for his insulin, his um, blood glucose machine, all the supplies, referred him to our certified diabetic educator who is embedded in our practice, and I asked him to go pick up all these supplies at the pharmacy and to come back that same day so we can go ahead and do all his teaching. He didn't come back that day, but did come in to see the certified diabetic educator a few days later. And all the teaching was done to meet the patient with his needs, keeping in mind his short-term memory deficit. Step-by-step -step instructions were sent home with him, and first insulin dose was done in the office. I asked him to come in three days later to see how he was doing on his insulin. He informs me he didn't start his insulin. He was nervous, but his wife is willing to help out, but she didn't come to the visit. So I said, no worries, we'll go ahead and do the teaching again in the office. And I referred him to our nurse care coordinator, um, who's also embedded in our practice, to set up a home visit to meet the patient and his wife um, at the home. So over that weekend, my nurse care coordinator went out to visit and the wife wasn't available, the patient was there, and he was unable to properly demonstrate use of the glucometer and was really frustrated that he just couldn't get it and he wouldn't use the insulin until he could master using the glucometer. And finally, after about a month, we were able to do a med reconciliation at home because he kept forgetting to bring his medications to the office. He comes in to see me a few weeks later. Insulin still hasn't been started, and I encouraged him, please bring back all your supplies. Our nurse care coordinator will go ahead and help you with all of this. He comes back in and sees the diabetic nutritionist. So all these services we have in our office, and he's reporting now that he's only been injecting a couple of days of insulin and wants to make sure he's doing it right. So our nutritionist, along with the nurse, validated that he is doing it right, and to, you know, they went ahead and encouraged him, please use it every day. So he comes in and sees me, and he is consistently using his insulin every day. So I begin seeing him less frequently, every one to two months, and our care coordination team, which includes our nurse care coordinator, our certified diabetic educator, our nutritionist, myself, um, all ensuring that he was following up on all our recommendations. Five months after he started insulin, his A1C went down from 11.5% down to 8.6%. I'm like, perfect, now we can start working on your other health problems. His high cholesterol, his fatty liver, his sleep apnea. Seven months after we began the insulin, his A1C is down to 6.9%. He reached his goal. But then at that visit, the challenges don't end. He informs me he can't afford his medications. And it's at this visit that we realized that he didn't have any prescription coverage. So our social worker embedded in our practice met with him that day and began the enrollment process for Medicare Part D. And $72.10 with co-pays is what it would cost him to pay for his medications every month, and he was okay with that. Um, but the caveat to that was that with this insurance, his insulin that I had prescribed him was not covered, and so we had to switch him to another preparation. Fortunately, he didn't have any challenges with learning how to use that particular preparation. While all this was going on, and this is the end of um, the story for now, um, he developed some lower back pain and some weakness in his left leg due to some spinal stenosis of his lower back, um, requiring him to use a cane to walk. And so I was able to send him to the pain interventionist who was able to give him a steroid injection in his back because his diabetes was well controlled. If he had presented a year before with these complaints, he would not have been a candidate for a steroid injection. It was successful in terms of relieving his pain about 50%, and so now he's going for back surgery. And Again, this would not have been possible if his diabetes, his glycemic control, was not where it needed to be. 
So I just want to summarize, through the efforts of our care coordination in our office, our end care coordinator, our social worker, our nurse supervisor, our certified diabetic educator, our nutritionist, my medical assistant, and the perseverance of my patient, and he was able to take control of his diabetes. The team was able to identify barriers and help him work through those barriers. His quality of life has improved, and I really hope he has a successful back surgery. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Pangergood. So what that's consistent with what we've been seeing at the board with the hospitals that have moved to fixed payment, we see them actually hiring personnel in areas such as social workers and emergency rooms, putting uh, mental health clinicians, nutritionists in primary care practices, allowing that care coordination to happen. So thank you for that story. It's consistent with what we've been hearing. I'm wondering if somebody else wants to jump in and think about, help us understand how that movement from fee-for-service, where you're generating more volume, to a fixed payment has allowed you to have some flexibility of resources to do different things. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Judy Peterson, and I want to start out by saying I've been a nurse for over 50 years, and uh, during the, about half of that time I've been in administration. This is the most exciting time in home care that I have ever experienced. Um, I'm retirement age. I don't want to retire. <laughs> it's too good. All the good stuff is beginning to happen. And that's really because the health care reform movement here in Vermont, from the very beginning, our um, ACO, One Care Vermont, engaged community organizations as partners. So it's really given home health the opportunity to begin doing some of the things we always knew were the right things to do, but we didn't have payment for them. And I want to give you one quick example. Um, in Chittenden County, uh, in our home health agency, we're doing a program that we call longitudinal care. For a long time, we had recognized that most of our referrals come from uh, hospitals after somebody had a hospital stay, so we do the post-acute work. We help stabilize people. Often, Medicare would pay for that if, it, if people were eligible for Medicare. But then, as soon as they became stable, they're no longer eligible for home health services. And we knew that, that oftentimes, that stability would not last very long. We would have been visiting somewhere between 30 and 60 days, doing all the kind, you know, many of the kind of things Judy was talking about, the uh, uh, medication management, uh, education, <clears throat> really helping people access other services in their community. But in 30 to 60 days, you, you heard how long it took for Judy's patient to really get on the right track. Well, that's exactly what happens with other people. So uh, One Care now uh, provides care coordination dollars to home health agencies. And so we're using that money to do a program to actually fund ongoing care for people even after they're no longer eligible for Medicaid, Medicare. So we're when they were on that skilled care Medicare service, they were getting nursing visits a couple of times a week, maybe a home health aid, maybe physical therapy. Um, but so when they're discharged from Medicare, we keep them on the home health agency services. So we still provide a nurse oversight. We do telemonitoring, which is kind of a, uh, it's an electronic, um, look, it's like an iPad that's in their home that will send um, uh, information back to the home health agency where one nurse monitors about 80 telemonitors in homes, and it gives us the person's blood pressure, heart rate, um, oxygen levels, and their weight, and which are really essential um, uh, data to be able to manage people with certain, especially cardiac diseases. Um, so in any event, uh, now that we're doing this program and we use community health workers who are a new discipline of people who they're not LNAs doing, you know, licensed nurses assistants doing personal care and they're not nurses doing all the assessment, but they're really coaches for the patient and they're able to visit a couple of times a week in the home. So um, we have, uh, uh, in December, we looked at the past year, how, how did the people on our program do? And our 20 patients on that program, we compared the 12 months on the program with 12 months prior, and we reduced hospitalizations by 30% and reduced um, emergency room visits by almost 10%. So that's a huge cost savings, and this is a not an expensive service. And it's really doing the right thing at the right place for the right, at the, at the right time. 
So I'll give you one quick example, and then I'll pass this on. Um, a woman named Linda, she's 67 years old. Um, prior to coming on to this program, she had had nine trips to the emergency room and three hospitalizations in the past year. Um, we provided her with monthly nursing visits, the, the telemonitor support, so that our telemonitor nurse would be able to contact her if she saw readings that were getting uh, out of whack. Um, and a community health worker visited also, and they did a lot of health coaching, disease management. And since uh, then, in the, so in the year that she was on service, she only had one hospitalization, and that was for, she went to the emergency room for abdominal pain and actually had an admission for liver abscess. So it was something that was very appropriate for acute level care. Um, the, the quote from uh, Linda is, and she was somebody who was constantly using health services. When not at the ED or, or having hospitalization, she was at her primary care uh, office. And she said, I haven't needed to go back to my doctor for four months now, and I've even walked outside with our dog. So, so we're talking quality of life also for patients. And uh, anyway, it's just I could tell you many, many stories, but I wanted to at least share that one. Thank you. Anybody else want to add? I'll just add a little piece to Judy's story. Um, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yes. Can everybody hear? Talk so, okay. No. no. Okay. Maybe use the microphone. I just want to add a little detail to Judy's story. So there's two parts to that. Um, for the UVM medical group, for our primary care providers, family medicine, internal medicine, we've changed their payment model from volume based to a panel size based. So that frees them up to not have to see every patient six times a month to get their salary. In the past, for most of my career in, in medicine, we had a volume-based model. So you had to see a certain number of patients per year, do a certain number of procedures to get your salary. For our primary care docs now, we give them a risk-adjusted panel, and their job is to keep that panel as healthy as they possibly can. If the most efficient way to do that is with a phone call, that's how you do it. If it's doing it through My Health Online and um, emails back and forth, if it's a visit, if it's a specialty consult, now you're paid to keep your panel healthy. In Judy's example, um, we're actually diverting dollars from our primary care dollar capitation budget to the VNA for this longitudinal care pilot. The way the waiver works, we're allowed to put some dollars in keeping people healthy in their homes is a very good investment in the new model. So I want to say that the reason that can work is not only one care, which allows us to do this, gives us the waiver, but it's now makes sense for that primary care office to have the VNA keep going after 60 days. Thank you. I'll, I'll stop on the way uh, down the line here. So um, I did want to talk about systems development because there has been a change and a shift in the way we approach patient care and care coordination. You know, you think about one patient at one time in front of you. And the shift is now from, yes, we continue to do that, but also we get a list of the high-risk and very high-risk patients um, that's been able to be determined through diagnosis, through medications, through ER visits, through um, inpatient visits. So we know the people that um, maybe we haven't been seeing, but they've been using the system. So we're able to, as a team, picture a group of, of nurses, social workers, people from the VNA, people from SASH, um, people from the other um, eight community agencies that we work with, HCRS, saying, um, okay, this is their list of people. Who's working with them? Who's on the team? Who needs to be on the team? How can we organize ourselves instead of working in silos? We can build systems to approach this systematically, reach out to people that, that aren't being seen currently right now. And we're developing stronger relationships. So I'm looking out into the audience and seeing George Karabakakis from HCRS. And, and you know, our, um, our partners are invested in a new way um, to help us help keep people um, uh, healthier. And we're able to do what we can do, and VNA is able to do what VNA can do. And we both know who's doing what on the case because we have joint care plans that are facilitated by new systems of electronic um, uh, capability through Care Navigator. So Care Navigator, for folks who don't know, is OneCare's software platform, right, that allows coordination of care 
problem. Right, right. So now we can jointly contribute to a care plan. Now I have to be honest with everyone, we're babies in this. So we're building a system. It's gonna take time to evolve, and but, we're, but the partners are together around the table and we have, as well as understanding through professional judgment, the patients like, um, like you talked about um, that are high risk. We can also have a list of people that we aren't seeing that we can reach out to. And the people that, you know, we weren't aware of the number of, of uh, emergency room visits. I think the other thing is that's changed is we're looking at a model of care so that, I, and I just have to say through One Care Vermont that the quadrants of care of understanding who are the well, who are the at risk, who are the complex, who are the very high risk patients so that we can look in a model of care and, and um, concentrate efforts on prevention to keep the well well. You know, to move the people that are at risk, keep them towards the well. And to move everybody in the continuum of care towards healthy behaviors. And you heard that when you heard about the A1C that went from 11 to six. Um, you saw, we see that in front of us. We also can see it as a system and as a model that looks at population health. I want to compliment One Care for the investment in RISE Vermont. We're able to really look at nutrition and exercise at a community level and build systems in place, working with our food shelves, working with our rec departments, working with new community partners instead of working in silos. Um, in ways that can set up systems and culture change that can emphasize health and healthy behavior. Again, keep the well well. Um, so I would agree um, with, um, is it Dr. Peterson? Um, uh, that Peterson. Nurse Peterson, <laughs> I, I too, have, and, and I say that with all of the admiration, I'm a nurse too for over 40 years and, and so we're sisters in this. It is exciting times to live because it's changing the way we can approach healthcare to really change moving towards health as a system and working instead of silos, working with community partners. I think the analytics that One Care has provided, I, I never thought I'd see in my lifetime. We can get reports both on individuals and on our population at large that we haven't been able to see and use before, so we have a true picture of who we are and where we need to go. Thank you. Hi, thank you for giving us the time to come and share our uh, clinical experiences and um, input. I've been a family doctor for 25 years, and I have to agree with Judy, it's the most exciting time in medicine for me, uh, given the opportunity to start seeing patients from a, an entirely different approach. Instead of sitting in my office and hoping somebody needs me or has a problem and needs to come in, I now am able to utilize a lot of different um, resources as well as aspects of our um, medical system to help promote wellness and prevention. And that is extremely satisfying in this profession, I would say. I wanted to share a couple of points. One is to tag on to what Dr. Leffler said about uh, changing our compensation model. At Porter, as uh, chief medical officer and also now involved with the medical group at UVM as of January, our physicians joined that medical group. We asked to be in a pilot study um, so that our primary care providers could be compensated partly for quality, which had been going on for about a year. So about 10% of our, our compensation comes from quality, meeting quality metrics. And we asked for another 10% to come from uh, population health metrics. And we came up with a list of nine population health efforts, or QI projects, and asked the primary care providers to choose two of those. Uh, and their pay is connected to that now. And some examples of that are um, promoting advanced directive completion, uh, follow-up after hospital or ER visit for a mental health problem within 30 days, uh, transitions of care coordination, educating our staff and each other about population health management, wellness and prevention, and how to promote that in our community, uh, getting involved with the MAT program locally. So I find all of that very inspiring, and uh, thankfully the providers have gotten on board with that. At Porter, about, I'm changing topics now, about five or six years ago, we started a palliative care program, which failed, I think, primarily because we were very um, aware of our fee-for-service model, and it didn't pay for itself. 
And so now we are excited that we have a palliative care physician again two days a week, soon to hopefully be four days a week in our community, helping our patients plan for their end of life, uh, working with families, coming up with a shared care plan. I can give a story about one of my own patients who in her approximately 80s uh, had chronic reoccurring pancreatitis and was in the hospital several times in the last year of her life. But because of our palliative care service was able to make a plan to go home with home health, have all the services she wanted at home, and the very last time when she could have gone to the hospital made a comfortable decision to stay at home, which was her desire, and she passed at home. But even, even at the end, uh, my office was called and I was asked, don't you want her to go to the hospital? And I said, no, we have this wonderful care plan in place, everybody's on board, and that's what she wants. So it was great to see that happen, and I'm glad that we have um, additional resources through our involvement with One Care and the All Care model to do these kinds of things. Going down the road, so, go ahead, Allison. <laughs> so I'm Allison Worst. I'm the Director of Care Management and Population Health at Porter, and I'm also a nurse practitioner. Most um, recently, I'd worked in the emergency department, and so I'd had a um, an example of a case that really hits on a few of my loves, both the emergency department as well as um, complex care coordination. So through the um, financial support of OneCare, as well as the changes in incentives around um, our, our payment model, and including some really good um, support from OneCare in developing programs around complex care coordination. We've created um, several positions at Porter Hospital for outpatient complex care managers, and we've also seen similar uh, changes in staffing in our designated agency, the Counseling Service of Addison County. Um, so they have a new, these tend to be very flexible, kind of nebulous positions where we have folks who are qualified to uh, do assessments of patients and kind of meet folks where they're at, but don't really fall into um, clearly defined roles that had existed prior to the payment reform. We, our highest um, utilizer of the emergency department is someone who has um, significant mental health needs, but also does have complex medical uh, needs as well. And so she was someone we always had in mind as we were developing these systems, both for the counseling service as well as for the outpatient setting. Um, in October of 2018, we were able to um, have both someone from the counseling, a nurse from the counseling service and a social worker who was newly hired to provide support and complex care coordination in the primary care office. Um, we had a visit with this patient in her primary care setting with both, the, again, mental health and social work support, um, and, and we're able to really formulate a good care plan for this patient. In looking at the three months prior to that initiation of care coordination, the numbers are sort of astounding if you don't work in an emergency department, but in the three months prior, she'd had 42 emergency department visits um, and five office visits. After we started implementing this complex care coordination, we really shifted that significantly. So still very high utilization of services, but we her emergency department visits were decreased by half, and that um, care shifted towards the primary care office and the mental health clinician who was doing home visits. And this was someone who was never willing to engage in mental health services. The other sort of thing that's not um, easy to capture in numbers is the um, emergency medical services. So for someone living in a fairly rural area, this had a huge impact on the ability for EMS to, pr to provide service um, to that area. They were very frequently driving her um, to the emergency department, so that was really impacting their ability to provide care across the board. Um, and, and really more importantly, the emergency department was not providing her care that was improving her quality of life. It wasn't addressing the real issues that were going on. It was very fragmented care. And so while her utilization is still quite high at this point, um, it's really focused much more in her medical home, focused on her mental health, um, and has really uh, significantly improved the, the quality of her life. I mean, this is only a, a brief snapshot in time, and I realize this isn't like a, you know, case closed, victory can be declared kind of a situation, but I think it's a really good example of how really intensive focus of the right kind of services for our most complex patients can have a really huge impact um, in many services. Good morning, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Fontaine. Uh, just want to make sure uh, that you understand that I am uh, doing lifestyle medicine, but I'm also the medical director of RISE Vermont. 
Um, so um, I work in the other quadrant than the majority of people here. I'm mean, definitely in the primary prevention wellness, which I've done for for many years. I was an obstetrician gynecologist for 25 years. I saw my patient getting um, older with me and having some chronic condition. In addition to what was going on, they went to their primary care that helped them to tell them that something needs to be changed, but eventually they would come back to me on medication. I was a little uncomfortable with that, knowing that my uh, previous studies when I was in Canada prior to medicine were in um, exercise physiology and obesity. So I, I started helping my patient easily in my office. Um, actually, I had a clinic where I was trying to help these women with significant improvement. Um, under that time, I was on myself. I was not with the hospital. So on this base model, lifestyle medicine is very difficult because there is no payment, really, model to help people with their lifestyle. So um, um, I will continue with something else. I'll come back with uh, what we've done at the hospital. But I just want you to know that lifestyle medicine is a specialty that exists. It's been there for over 10 years. Um, there's now a board certification that exists since last year. So I'm a board certified in lifestyle medicine. There's also another physician in Springfield, Dr. Scott Durgan, who is also certified in lifestyle medicine. So the uh, work of the primary prevention with uh, RISE Vermont. RISE Vermont is a movement. But it's a community-based intervention. We try to help people to change their lifestyle. We started that in Franklin Grand Isle uh, with implementing health coaching. Uh, we amplify what people are doing into the school, community, businesses, and it's making a difference to the point that we succeed to uh, work with One Care and expand this model since last year in all the different uh, community. The state uh, team is doing an amazing effort, and I'm proud to be working with them. As far as the uh, lifestyle component, uh, actually, I did some work my, and by myself, but eventually, becoming an employee of uh, NMC, um, I had a chance to try to uh, work with them. And it, actually, it's in 2016, Jessica, that we came and asked the Green Mountain Care Board to uh, revisit a little bit the uh, uh, cut that NMC had and say, listen, can we have a little bit of this money back to work uh, in primary care? And, and we did. You know, when you have what is possible, you, you can do some amazing thing. Um, so a lot of people that have some, uh, me, my work in lifestyle is basically more into the early secondary prevention. Uh, where people are starting to move into the second quadrant, this is the best time to try to bring them back. You know, when you think about it, uh, one of the biggest thing is that 86% of our healthcare cost is chronic disease. 80% of that is related to our lifestyle. The cost is increasing not because of the healthcare system, it's because of us and our lifestyle. We need to make those changes, but to make those changes is not easy. Being a physician and try to tell them once is helpful, but these people need to be assisted. They need to have people help them to make those changes. So we've implemented into my group having some health coaching, which is an evidence-based model recognized at the national level. We work on self-determination, self-efficacy, Motivational interviewing is always, you know, part of that. But you know, the way to change the individual is to work on their personal intrinsic motivation. It is not me, Dr. Fontaine, that will change him. It is you that will bring. I'm going to bring you to your best self, and then we can make those changes. So when we succeed to make those changes in 2016, that helped us not only to improve care coordination. We took some money that will allow it to continue with that, to stabilize Rise Vermont, and to lifestyle. I brought some program that we call CHIP. It's a uh, um, complete health improvement program that educate people into nutrition. It's a nationally recognized nice program. There's over 80,000 people that were successful of changing substantially their lifestyle and improve, um, you know, their um, result of chronic disease, reversing and preventing chronic disease. I've done about seven group of uh, this CHIP program. Um, the actual group that we're doing is uh, with eight individuals. 
and maybe one story is this young guy because usually it's women that participate but for a change I have a young man who's 26 6 2 had cholesterol at 350 with his bad cholesterol LDL at over 180 well by changing his diet and with this education and he had a family history he was very concerned about his father with these changes, in three weeks we recheck his number, everything was back to normal. Lifestyle. We need to change that. It is feasible. So now what we're doing is after doing this implementation of a lifestyle clinic um, with my patient, with a nice hand on to the uh, life coach, we're now um, trying to implement this model into primary care and I'm going to be working with Dr. Fingergott in order to help her uh, and her patient kind of a community uh, approach. Do you, a quick question for you and then I'd love to hear from the other panelists that haven't spoken, but do you anticipate because we've moved away from the speaker service model towards this value-based model, now you have lifestyle medicine at Springfield and at Northwestern, do you anticipate that this model is going to spread throughout the to the other hospitals and other primary care practices because now there's an incentive. Yeah, well, I think so, and that's my hope. I never anticipate that I would do that before the end of my career. You know, being a specialist in the second, um, like I didn't anticipate that. So we're really trying to pilot the model and see if this is working, obviously, with my uh, partner, family uh, practice. I would love to see it expanding to the um, state. I'm not sure if we heard Dr. Haddock, or Carla. Well, she's ahead of me. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Carla Camelot, and I'm so pleased to say that I work for Mount Escutney Hospital with, with Jill, our community health director leader. Um, and she really pulls together our partnership for community health. I'm also thankful that I work for um, Mount Escutney Pediatrics and also at the Ottaquichi Health Center as the care coordinator. And I'm totally a boots on the ground person. I'm out there in the community networking. We hear about silos. Um, we formulated many partnerships within the community. I go once a month to the Woodstock High School and the entire mm -hmm. school staff of principals, psychologists, counselors, uh, school nurses come into a team and we start on prevention. Who are the high risk students? Get a release, we start formulating on plans. I go and visit with the parent and the family to start that process and we filter back and network. So that's one piece of the partnership. I also complete hours over at the Thompson Senior Center in Woodstock where I'll get referrals coming in, but also following up in the home. And I have to say that what I'm hearing and have heard for the past five years from patients, thank you for coming to the home. Thank you for listening and also thank you for getting to know who we are. And then I also go back and will share that with the primary care physician. I have lots of stories I could tell you um, to go on and on, but to speak to a few on partnership and also on team modeling and bringing people together. So in pediatrics, we've had some extremely complex care um, children and not only in their physical health, but also mental health and speaking quite bluntly just to trauma. These children have been extremely traumatized. Um, a couple of the patients that we ha share on one care, Care Navigator, um, the children both have been into facilities such as the Brattleboro Retreat, um, in and out with the parents coming back to the table. And this week, for instance, we just sat down with DCF, the foster parent, the child's therapist, and um, the guardian ad litem and our pediatrician. And the success from two years ago is amazing. This child is thriving, not only because being in the foster home right now that they are, but also because there were wraparound services. Everybody was connected to say, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Who's the lead in this case? And let's sit back down and discuss what's going to be for next steps. 
The other child um, also came in a few weeks ago with their foster mom, DCF came in with a pediatrician and he also had his siblings um, there. This child went through some really significant physical abuse um, and some trauma through their parent being totally involved in the drug world. He is now thriving because everybody stepped up to say, okay, let's take a look at what needs to happen, long time coming, but he's with a very stable foster home and they just are, they love him to death. Um, and he's succeeding once again, not only in the physical piece, but mental health. A long ways to go, but um, we're getting there. I also go to, um, with Twin Pine Housing in Woodstock and I'm there every Monday morning for a couple of hours and uh, Twin Pines uh, built affordable housing, Safford Commons. And so I've gotten to know through um, each Monday, just checking in with um, tenants who are most of our patients at OHC. And I have to say some who have not, did not have a primary care physician, I've encouraged them to make sure that they have a primary physician. So that's been of help as well. But everyone gets checked in on. We have some very complex cases um, with eviction. And I know HCRS has been helpful in a couple of cases. Um, we had an uh, elderly lady, and this is a work in progress still, but I feel we've gained some success. Um, her apartment was totally infested with fruit flies. I've never seen anything like it. Um, substance abuse, alcohol abuse work in progress, the check-ins, um, just having that respect and trust has taken a long time. I can say this week we've made a lot of groundwork. I've spent a lot of hours on the stairwell saying I'm here, um, you know, if you'd like to come out and speak with me. So that's taken time. Um, her case manager, she just, uh, um, they got back together to take her food shopping. I'm taking her to her medical appointments to make sure she gets there. That's the other important piece, transportation. A lot of people will say, I don't have a ride. Um, not a problem, let me look at your schedule, my schedule, let's just get you there. And not only will I get you there, but I'm going to sit there with you if you'd like me to, because we all know when we get there, we don't always walk away saying, what, did, what was I just told? What am I supposed to do? Um, but making sure that they're bringing in their medications before they leave the house so that the physician and the nurse can check in um, with them. Um, yesterday we made, or two days ago, we made great strides. And just speaking of how the networking goes, um, we have a case and, uh, at the Ottaquichi Health Center where we have a patient with intense schizophrenia, um, morbid obesity, diabetes, and they live in an area that's so remote that they're not able to get out during the winter time and they don't want anybody at the house. Um, they've abused 911 services. I believe it's been six calls within a very short amount of time and the patient, when they get there, says that they want food. Um, law enforcement has checked, there's plenty of food in the house. So what this came to is like, how can we help this patient? We all met, uh, myself and the HCRS team met the other day to say, we're formulating a plan, let's start working on this. Um, Carla, if you could do weekly calls to the patient, because the patient's always calling the health center and really tying up important time. And we're gonna have somebody call, the case manager call in and do weekly checks until we can get the foot in the door. Um, and then the therapist, they just assigned um, not only the patient, but her spouse to meet with a therapist. And then we'll go um, through the psychiatrist. But what I wanna say how important that is because it's already worked. I can see that from yesterday in speaking to the patient to say, we all care about you. And we're all working on a plan for you and you're gonna be a part of this plan as the director. So um, that's gonna be a long ways coming, but I, and just listening to the family yesterday, that's so important. 
So um, the bottom line is, yes, we do get out of the silo, but if you're in the community and talking, there's even business people um, that want to be of help. So you use your other resources to make it work for the patient. Thank you. No, no, no. I did. Bring us on. Well, uh, my name's Joe Haddock. I've been in primary care in Williston for over 40 years, and I'm self-employed. Um, I would say, and to several of the people in the audience that I've <laughs> been in meetings with for a long time, uh, are well aware that my goal is not reforming the whole care, health care system, but I realize that um, primary care will form the basis for any new system that evolves. And so my goal is to uh, try to pre preserve primary care. Um, and for primary care practice and independent primary care, especially, not changing the system is the worst thing that can happen. And um, I'm convinced of that. I will say there's been a lot of all-payer model Kool-Aid served up here, and uh, I didn't mean that pejoratively. Um, and we at the Thomas Tittenden Health Center, now, is it all right to talk about the pilot? Yes, absolutely, okay. please do. So we at the Thomas Tittenden Health Center, we sip on the Kool-Aid a little bit uh, in this overall broader all-payer thing that's occurring. but. Um, we evaluated it last year and we decided we would uh, drink a lot of Kool-Aid and be a part of an all-payer model pilot, which, um, for which about 30 to 35 percent of our total patient population of 18,000 or so uh, is attributed. Uh, the question here is, has the movement from fee-for-service to fixed payment changed how our practice is? Well, I can't say that in the broader picture is, but through the pilot, I would say it really is. So that's a little different, and it's a subset of this whole program. Um, and what changes, I gotta be honest, what changes how you deliver medicine, how you deliver care to people, how you coordinate care, is money. And it doesn't matter what system it is, and primary care to, and all these other services offered, there's gotta be money somehow. So we joined up with this pilot, and uh, I will say for the state, again, off subject a little bit, um, the blueprint has been a wonderful thing in this state. I would say it's not lucrative, and for smaller practices, it costs more to qualify for it than you get out of it money-wise. But through, for our practice, embedded social workers, embedded uh, nutritionists and diabetic educators, panel manager, people seeing that they got their visits made. The blueprint's been great. Um, again, not lucrative. And the barriers to going to primary care, too. One is reimbursement. The second is the large burden of administrative, bureaucratic overhead. So um, the pilot increases the latter a little bit, the former minimally. <coughs> So, I'm not sorry, I'm sorry, the blueprint does that. The pilot has worked out well for us and without increasing our bureaucratic and administrative burden has uh, resulted in um, a better financial picture for our office and our abilities to start a couple of new programs. I was asked to talk about a couple of those. Uh, one of those is, um, we've had a, you have to give away your oldest kid to get a psychiatrist in this state. So we have, um, started out with a nurse practitioner two days a week embedded in our office two doors down from mine um, and she sees patients from our practice we used the money extra money we got from this program to start up her program we use it to pay her to see patients whose insurances won't cover it unfortunately MVP doesn't cover it if you don't have nine or twelve experiences years of experience so it's been very helpful in that. And then it was so successful that one of our nurse practitioners who has 25 years experience, um, we kind of supported going back to become certified in psychiatric nurse practitionerhood, is that a word, um, <laughs> this year. And so she's going to 
stay in the practice and do that a couple days a week. So we'll then have four days a week, as it's planned, of embedded psychiatric help and patient, for patients and patients without insurance, patients with insurances that won't cover. Um, and I think that's a place where the added dollars to our practice has changed how we care for patients, the quality of care we give for patients. And also, it's very important to have that psychiatrist in your building. It doesn't scare the heck out of those patients to go off to somebody they don't know, because it's already a, a vulnerable group psychologically, and they don't have to go to a new building. You can introduce them to them. So that's been very helpful. We also were able to um, increase the hours for our certified diabetic educator, somebody men mentioned, uh, slash nutritionist for patients whose insurance don't cover. If you have Medicare and you're overweight, Medicare doesn't pay for overweight, but Medicare will pay if you have high cholesterol or, or diabetes or renal failure. Right. But there's a lot of people we're trying to prevent to those things, so we can now have her see those patients and assist us with them in-house. And um, that's changed the way we deliver care as well. The third project of ours was to keep our laboratory in-house because um, we feel it's more efficient, quicker, more convenient for patients, but also costs a lot less than getting your blood drawn and, and your laboratory work done at the hospital. So uh, this new pilot program of which we're a part has resulted in at least three areas where we feel we provide better care, hopefully keep people out of the hospital. And I think it's going to take a few years of results here to know that for sure. But with our new, and we have a new care coordinator through this program as well, um, we've documented about five people since Christmas who ended up not in the hospital because we had somebody to coordinate whatever care they needed, and it may be different kinds. One other thing I would say is I think this um, pilot subgroup of the all-payer problem, or all-payer plan, um, has enabled us to recruit a new physician. And now that's something in independent primary care is uh, extremely difficult. Um, so I think for my ultimate goal, that seems to, be, seems to have been successful. We'll find out before too long somebody else has to match for a program and that sort of thing. Can you, um, essentially, can I interrupt you? Can you explain why it helped you recruit? What was it about the, the pilot program that helped you? Well, money. <laughs> we well, could offer. Curious if there were some providers out there who were really excited about what Vermont is doing, and that was actually an attraction to. Well, uh, loan repayment plans, um, travel assistance, signing bonus. Boy, when I practiced, you had to pay to join the practice. Now, <laughs> when I started, now it's long ways from that. Um, so I would say that this, at least especially the subset of the all-payer model that is this pilot, we've been very pleased with. Now, I'm sure it doesn't fit for every practice. There are practices um, a capitated model won't work as well for if you have a group, if you have a demographic group that goes to the doctor six or seven or eight times a year, then a, this capitated model may not be as uh, good for you financially. If you have a practice where we're in the average patient goes to the doctor three or four times a year, and the capitation is appropriate, of course, then uh, it's, it'll be successful. So I don't think it's for everybody yet, but um, so far it's been good for us, and we haven't overdosed on the Kool-Aid, but we're, it has tasted pretty good so far. <laughs> we'll see how next, next year does. Off to Steve. Right. I was just going to actually ask a quick question about follow-up. So what my next question was going to be about, you know, the all-payer model, the ACO model has increased its emphasis on integrated care. We've heard a lot of stories about the care integration. I'm wondering if you all could speak to whether, what is, to what would you attribute the increased focus on care management? Is it the fact that there's more funding now, population health payments for care coordinators? Is it the tools that are available, the care navigator? that's allowing uh, you know, different providers across the care continuum to share information? Is it the training and consultation that comes with attributing lives to the all-care model and one care? What would you attribute the increased uh, care management to? What do you think is driving that success? 
I'll start since I have the mic. Um, I actually think it's all those things. I think it's a, a blend of all these things that are different. So every person on this panel that um, went into medicine for whatever reason, their goal is to keep their community and their patients as healthy and well as possible. But for most all of our careers, we were paid to take care of sick people. And so for the primary care docs on this panel, literally if someone called you and you knew they had a UTI, and you knew you could call in a prescription and make them better, you lost revenue for that, okay? So this model helps get around things like that at a, just a micro level. This model is funding our community partners to do the work they need to do and have been starved for funding for many years for a wide variety of reasons. And as you move towards a wellness model, it suddenly makes sense to invest upstream because you don't need to see one more patient in the ED. You don't need to have one more admission. I mean, for most of our careers, a readmission was bad for the patient, but good for the hospital. For every life that's covered under the ACO, a readmission is one of the worst things that could happen. You know, you have to get people. So at UVM Health Network, we've made a major investment in a care transition team. We have a, a doctor whose full-time job mostly is making sure that when people come in the hospital, we know all the information from Thomas Chitton, we know every detail of their meds and all that, and we send them back to Thomas Chitton, we make sure there's a seamless transition or if they're going to the nursing home. We've added a, a new a leader who does uh, our care coordination both inpatient, social work, and outpatient. Those transitions of care are expensive now if you get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So I would tell you there's a major shift in now it suddenly is financially viable to keep your community and your patients as well as possible. One thing I would say that's changed um, with the care coordinators especially. Care navigator, we're still kind of lukewarm on that, but partly because of a lot of what would go into care navigator from the community, we have embedded in our office. So it hasn't been as beneficial and it's a little unwieldy yet. But one of the big changes I would address, again, being old, is that uh, several years ago, almost all the hospitals in the state switched to inpatient care being cared for by hospitalists. And one of the biggest one of the most common times to make errors in patient care is when you switch providers, whether it's a nursing provider, physician, PA, whoever. And um, that became a real problem with the advent of hospitals for a while. Um, some of us were in a hospital a lot anyway, so it's not as hard, but I think the care coordinators that we have hired in our office through this program um, they call every patient when they go out of the hospital and we've got everything right there, and that's a huge help. Um, discharge summaries, <laughs> they don't always have everything in them you need and they don't always get there, but the care coordinator for transition out of the hospital has been extremely beneficial. And then the care coordinator um, who, switch, who for us coordinates with nursing homes, and now we have a lot of short-term rehab for their in a nursing home or wherever for four weeks, six weeks, has been very helpful in that as well. Um, so with the increased fragmentation of hospital versus community versus outpatient care, the care coordination has helped a lot. I can't put a dollar amount on it, but we can name people that didn't get hospitalized because of it. You want that? I just wanted to add, um, in speaking to the same for a segue, is that also our falls prevention for EMS um, is very involved. So when they go to a home where there's a fall and there's going to be a transport, they always follow up with me to say, this is what we found out in the community. Would you please follow up and coordinate with us to make sure they're taken care of with their PCP? where they need to be. And that's worked, I know, at least in four cases. Um, one in particular um, we just dealt with this past week where I got a phone call from the senior center to say, did you know the ambulance is over at one of your patient's homes in the complex? So I went right over and there's the ambulance and um, the deputy chief of the EMS who's in charge of false prevention and she's like oh my gosh she said this is perfect timing and so we were able just to coordinate right there on the spot um, next steps for this patient um, which worked rather well so I think it's just an added piece once again that the more community involvement you have the better off your patient is going to be 
I think one of the things that's helped has been the emphasis on training and looking at best practices. It started with the blueprint, um, with looking at a care coordination um, learning collaborative, and then continued with one care so that we're getting tools and, and education and building capacity while we're doing this work, because you're training a new workforce and you're working with people that are doing new things. And so workforce is, a, is an area that's of concern for all of us, and we need to help people be prepared and, and last in their jobs. I mean, frankly, we're, we're, we've had people that have started in some of the, the positions it wasn't a match. We need, to, we need to help build a new workforce that can do this work and, and really help people. And I think providing that training and the best practice tools um, has been able to help us make that transition. I agree with what has been said about the fact that it is the additional funding, both through the blueprint and through OneCare, that has allowed Porter and our practices to employ dietitians, mental health providers, therapists, care coordinators. And before, it was we couldn't justify it. In a fee-for-service world, there's just no money for that. Uh, I think um, we do need to think about our workforce. Uh, we don't have enough social workers. We don't have enough mental health providers in our state. We don't have people going into those fields, and, and we need more of them. So we need to focus on, on that education. I think there's still a lag. Uh, I am, I'm concerned about educating our providers and our healthcare force about this new style of practicing medicine. I think a lot of us are on board, but there's still a lag in an understanding. I think my perspective being a primary care provider and also the chief medical officer at the hospital uh, lets me see a little bit into how some people are still really focused on, we need the ER to be humming, we need the main floor to be full, and even Dr. Niffin, as much as I love him, he's like, oh, the main floor isn't full, and I said, great, we don't want people in there, and he's like, but then how do we get paid? So it's just this this um, changeover that I think is, uh, we're right in the middle of it, and I I believe it is the right thing to do. Um, I think that care coordination tends to happen fairly naturally when you put people who care about that passionately in the right places and meeting patients where they're at. Um, and this funding model has really supported us in doing that with money to hire care coordinators. Um, and it's really, I, I think that healthcare has been sort of late to the party on this. Um, we know that designated agencies for mental health, home health agencies, um, SASH, AgeWell, um, those are folks who have been doing really great care coordination, but often when they would call the primary care offices, the, their mindset and sort of the mindset of the folks in the primary care office often didn't meet up. Um, and so to have someone who answers the phone in primary care and says, how can I get help with whatever messy, probably not medical problem is going on right now um, has really been key. And then those relationships develop naturally um, and then continue to get stronger as we work together mutually with patients and finding it really satisfying. Um, I think anytime we think that there's an electronic fix for a problem that we have, um, we're often a bit disappointed. Um, so while there's been a lot of excitement around Epic and Care Navigator is a, a good tool, it really is only a, one part of what we're doing. It's really about the people and the relationships that we're developing. Thanks. I think that um, uh, some of the the, the tra this transition to more care coordination <clears throat> between acute and post-acute, you know, all the community providers, is really because of our focus on the triple aim. The triple aim of healthcare is to improve the patient experience, improve health outcomes, and reduce cost. We know we can't do that just by admitting people to the hospital, by letting people get sick. So there's really been, uh, and this is why I was saying before how much I'm enjoying my job in, in home health right now, is because there's really this recognition in Vermont, and really is starting to be nationwide also, um, that hospitals aren't going to do it on their own. We all need to work on this together. So that means we've got to start doing a better job of communicating with one another. Um, one of the really wonderful things that I'm looking forward to is uh, the uh, VNA of Chittenden and Grand Isle Counties. We've renamed ourselves the UVM Health Network Home Health and Hospice because we became part of the network in, in January 2018. So that means in another couple of years, we're also going to be able to be on the EPIC medical record system. So to actually have home health staff 
and the hospital and many of the, the primary physicians, uh, pr primary offices, being able to all be sharing the same medical records. So it's not just that our records could talk to each other, we'll be sharing the same medical records. So then it's just, it just becomes so much more transparent. I'm lo really looking forward to that. And, and I've got to say, um, you know, I, I, uh, I grew up in Vermont in the Northeast Kingdom, and we love to tell stories in the Northeast Kingdom. And so uh, before I pass the, the microphone to Dr. Fon Montaigne, of course, is so focused on wellness. I want to say that the focus on wellness has just given me a whole new opportunity for stories. So one of them is that my mother started jogging when she was 80. <laughs> now we don't know where the hell she is. <laughs> So in my model, care coordinator, I don't need it. It wouldn't exist. No, I, I'm just saying that. So I'm going to pass it. I don't, I don't have uh, the chance to work so much with care coordinator because in where I work into the lifestyle, I, I don't have this team. However, with the implementation of having a coach uh, that would be working in primary care, then I would uh, become a, a lot more in association with my um, partner. Now, I, I, I didn't say anything earlier. Um, you know, obviously, everybody has recognized my act. Since I'm a French Canadian. Um, my father was a physician, and, and I was in the area where the universal model was born. So I went from putting stamp on bill with my mother when I was eight year old, not knowing what I was doing, or seeing people bringing home eggs or maple syrup, which was pretty interesting, but eventually having the um, card that allowed them to, to be treated. Um, and um, as much as we can say against the uh, Canadian, Indian model, um, everybody's treated there without having to, um, you know, um, to go through what we have to do in our current system. So I think that Vermont is ahead of the game, and, and I'm very uh, um, interested in to the effort that uh, uh, we are doing here in the all-payer model. Um, so. Thank you. so I have two comments, and to answer the question, you know. What are my thoughts in terms of like why um, integration and care coordination um, has evolved? I agree with, to the point that everyone has made, um, but I really feel that um, making primary care practices a recognized NCQA patient-centered medical home, and um, when you look back to the advent of all of that, and I have been in um, two practices that have been patient-centered medical homes, and I've worked um, on that whole recognition process, that is the hallmark of a patient-centered medical home, and care coordination um, is at the center of it. And so to be a robust patient-centered medical home, you must have a robust care coordination. And I feel like that's where everything began. Um, I previously practiced in New York State for 23 years before I came to Vermont. And so I want to kind of bring back to the point that Dr. Haddock made a little while ago about um, the necessity of primary care being the foundation of all of this. Um, without primary care, without folks that want to go into primary care, physicians, um, nationwide we're having a shortage, we're having everywhere problems with recruitment and retention, we need to make primary care desirable. Why am I here in Vermont? Because I got to a point in my career, I've been practicing for 25 years, I got a point in my career where healthcare really reached a dark place, and I saw what was happening in Vermont. And it piqued my interest. I came up here. I spoke to folks up here. And I was like, you know what? This is what I want to be a part of. So I thank Vermont and everyone who's been working so hard here, because that's what brought me here. And if we can really, as we're trying to, for those of us that are in the recruitment um, um, positions here, if this is what we share, if this is what we share with our medical students, and that you know, healthcare can make changes, because you go into primary care, and if we can show what we can do and where we can go, then I think um, not just as a state, but as a nation, um, we'll be in a much better place. Well, thank you. On that, and all those comments incredibly valuable and insightful. I want to um, not monopolize any more time here and open it up to my colleagues on the board. If you have follow-up questions for any of our panelists, please, please go for it. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I, ha I had a question about um, sort of some of the, the challenges of implementing uh, this kind of community-based model. So one of the things that we hear on the board is 
um, a cons I wouldn't say really a criticism, it's more just a concern that when you look at ACO evidence across the country, uh, there seems to be a quicker return on investment in programs that are very top-down, network restrictive, and really operated more like an insurance model. In Vermont, we've chosen not to go that route, first with the blueprint, and now with uh, having one care work collaboratively and really integrated with the blueprint. So I wonder if you could speak to what you see as either some of the challenges of creating this really community-based approach as opposed to uh, an, more of a, what I would call an insurance model kind of directed approach. Um, or, if, you know, I think you've highlighted some of the benefits of that in terms of really integrating the community. But I just wanted to put that out there because that is an issue that we hear um, and a concern about maybe the road that we've chosen in terms of a community-based approach either may be less effective or uh, maybe harder to implement or maybe may take more time. I don't know. Um, so I think that the needs of different hospitals and different health service areas are pretty dramatically different. One of the things that, you know, my experience with OneCare has been that there is a lot of guidance, a lot of training opportunities, a lot of presentation of best practices, and then very intensive support as we develop our programs. But thinking of the needs of Porter Hospital, which is a 25-bed critical access hospital, um, as compared to just an hour north, um, the medical center, our needs are vastly different. And a one -size fits all solution would, would never work. Um, I do think it has been a little bit slow in developing our, well, I don't know if slow is the right word because maybe it's the right pace, but it, it has taken time to develop our processes. Um, again, very kind of step by step with OneCare. Um, and, and I feel like that has really allowed us to put in a plan that doesn't just feel like the, the flavor of the month and here's a new checkbox and we're going to focus on it for three months and then we all forget about it. This feels like really lasting change that we're creating. Um, um, I, I, I think OneCare has given us the financial oomph to get over this initial hump of it's not going to be an immediate return on our investment, um, but we can already see really huge changes in our utilization patterns, um, both anecdotally as well as um, with the, the big data that we're able to get uh, using Care Navigator and the claims-based data. So yes, slower, but also really necessary, I think, for an area that has such different um, health service areas. Um, for those of you who remember, we tried the top-down thing with CHP slash Kaiser. And um, literally in Williston, Vermont, we had to call Oakland, California if we wanted to sand our parking lot more than once a day. Um, now that's a little bit hyperbole, <laughs> but that's the kind of way it was run. Um, we were supposed to see 3.2 patients per hour. You worked four or four and a half sessions a week. You couldn't work weekends. None of the nurses could work overtime. Um, it was, we were making widgets. And I think from my own point of view, and I'm independent to a fault, that if it's done from the bottom up, sort of the bottom up, um, it'll be more successful and more customized to the needs of the individual patient population that that practice sees. That's our experience. To build on that, uh, one of the conditions of the all-payer model is that uh, providers voluntarily join. And when the providers join, they bring in the lives. And the goal over five years is to get 70% of Vermonters in this model and 90% of Medicare recipients. And um, while it's probably a little more painful to do it by the voluntary method, that's what's sustainable. Bringing people together on a panel like this that all want to talk about how great it is, how it's changing primary care, how they can recruit new doctors here, is really what's going to make this stay and last in Vermont. The, I would tell you the hard part is that if we could flip the switch today and be to full capitation, we, we'd be much better off because then all these sounds would completely align. We're living in this world right now where 20% to 30% of our lives are capitated, which incents you to do care one way, and the other part is fee for service. This does give our hospitals which have very high fixed costs, an adjustment time to get to right sizing, but it's very painful going through the, the, the slow changes that happen when you're half in one model and half in the other is what I would say. 
just to build on that, one of the things that I've um, we've struggled with is the fact that in Care Navigator you only have the attributed lives, but we take care of a full population. So we want to get to the place where all of the patients are, we are able to talk with all of our partners. So right now we have some of our partners at the table, but we actually work with the schools who aren't really at the one care table yet. But we know they need to be because we're working with them for the pediatric population. So there is struggles and challenges in a system that's evolving, but I believe it's evolving in the right way and, and it can't happen overnight. And I'll just piggyback on what um, Joel just had to say. It is challenging when we get the list to know that our partners are working with us, economic services, DCF, the schools, but they're not actually in the system. So that's a hiccup there that we need to get over a speed bump. I think another factor contributing to the slowness of, of doing this, and I do think we're doing it the right way, uh, for us has been a lack of data analytics. And I think um, as we move forward with uh, all, at least the UVM network and others around the state being on EPIC and being able to share our data and manage our data and analyze our data together, uh, we can drive this and hopefully the speed will pick up after we're better able to do that. And <clears throat> from the home health point of view, I would echo what Steve said. We really live with a foot at each canoe because we are, um, for home health, we're not capitated, we're still in a fee-for-service uh, program um, for reimbursement. So we're following all the very uh, strict Medicare rules to be able to be reimbursed for clients who are Medicaid, uh, Medicare eligible. For Medicaid, we follow a different set of rules, and there are skilled care rules and long-term care rules. For health insurance companies, it's a little different again. So it takes, uh, you know, we end up spending more money on administrative overhead than we want to because we have to, you know, be compliant with all of these different programs where we really feel like if we were in in a truly capitated system, we'd be able to do the right care for the right person in the right place, talk to the right people, and uh, um, it would be so much easier. But so it, it is that you know we're we're able to do that longitudinal care program I described because one care is supporting that with extra dollars. Um, but so we would there's so many other things we would love to do, and we are starting to do more pilots. Um, I, I do want to say that there's a part of the of one care is a waiver uh, for home health agencies to be able to do home visits to people who have had a hospitalization even if they are not homebound. Homebound is one of the Medicare criteria. A person has to be homebound and needs skilled care and intermittent care to, re to uh, be eligible for home care services. But this new waiver through one care, when we're just experimenting, we're just beginning it now with one practice, Colchester Family Practice in Chittenden County, um, and we'll be able to see people because when you've had an acute care, uh, uh, an acute stay, even if you're able to get out and about or you're, you're um, not requiring like uh, dressing changes or some particular skilled care, people still have their medications uh, uh, confusion. They might not be able to get their medications or have transportation. There might be home safety issues. There are just so many things that um, we'll be able to address. And it's just one or two visits, but we really believe it's going to help uh, decrease rehospitalizations of patients who've had a hospital stay. So in my little model of lifestyle medicine, I always say that um, I want to coach a village to health. So for me, in order to be able to do that, I need to absolutely be in a capitated environment because in fee-for-service, it doesn't exist. I would have not been able to survive in the fee-for-service model. I've explored, a lot of people do it, cash base, and I was thinking about my own model. I said, well, the people that really need my help, they don't have the money to come cash base. So the only way for me to work that way is to have a capitated environment. And if it was not of my hostel that believe in to putting money in this innovation, I wouldn't be here to talk. So it's very important that uh, you know we progress in this model. Just want to make um, you know one comment. I think one of the challenges is that we're trying to service patients that geographically um, are far from you know where we can provide services to, and um, 
And when you're thinking of trying to provide services to perhaps like one or two families, you know, how do you justify sending a team out where it could be like an all-day affair and to service that? And often these are um, families that technologically and we can't provide services such as telemedicine. So sure, I think I'll direct this one directly to Steve and others ask others to uh, join in on the, the conversation. But one of the uh, challenges on being successful and moving away to uh, value-based rather than um, uh, fee-for-service is getting a large enough panel and a large enough pool. And one of the struggles we've seen in Vermont is getting take up by the private commercial market. And I know that UVM has tried to be a leader by putting their own employees in that. And I was wondering what you would say to others who are considering a decision to take this um, leap of faith and try a different approach. W what would the conversation look like, Steve? Well, so first off, I think there's two big parts to that. Number one, it's absolutely one care and the providers have to show that we're gonna add value. We're gonna have to add value to whatever piece of that premium. So the way that model would work is most of these plans are administrated by an insurer, think Blue Cross or MVP, and they're getting a premium right now to administer the plan. And what you're asking for is to have a little bit of that premium. And with those dollars, you're going to keep that panel either healthier. They're going to be showing up work less absenteeism. They're going to have overall less health care costs. So we piloted at the medical center last year how that could work to build on that. And I can tell you right now that um, it, within one care, we're spending a lot of time right now figuring out um, how much of that premium is the right amount and what are we going to do with it to help keep people so when a, when a large self-insured population comes in, like the UVM Health Network, or like the City of Burlington, or National Life, what are they gonna get that's different, that adds value to that premiums? And I would tell you those are things, so like lower absenteeism, healthier population, low overall, low overall healthcare costs. The delivery system firmly believes that those dollars flowing to your providers and their care teams around them is where we can make a big difference. Because all the stuff you're hearing here, I think we can bring out to those employers in a way that's different than is happening right now. Thank you, does anybody else want to? One thing I would expand that to is, um, I would like to see, I don't know if anybody can do it, but all self-employed groups benefit from the blueprint, but they don't pay into it. And somehow or other, I don't know how you can require that, but if you can demonstrate a benefit from the all-payer plan, you can certainly demonstrate a benefit from the blueprint and the embedded services or extra services we all provide that employees of self-insured self, uh, self companies are benefiting from but not paying into. So I think that could be expanded from all-payer model to the blueprint as well. I'll just finish with, um, at the medical center, we have some data that shows that what was a good model last year. We have to do more. We're not really ready to roll that out, but um, it was successful last year, and uh, One Care is very interested in growing this and figuring out exactly the pieces is the sp stuff we're spending lots of time on right now. Thank you. I'm... Uh, struck today by the contrast between what we're talking about this morning and what we will be talking about this afternoon. Um, this morning, the affirmation of, of uh, One Care and, and you folks on the ground achieving what you're achieving is, is heartwarming, um, and I'm glad to see it. This afternoon, we will be in the process of reviewing uh, the uh, QHP uh, benchmark plans. Um, and I'm struck by the contrast that, for example, speaking of like pre-diabetes, that uh, you can, uh, under the benchmark plan, go get a preventive health checkup and be told that you're pre-diabetic. Uh, and then the next step is you've got to kind of hop through these hoops of deductibles and co-pays to get to the only remedy that they provide, which is, which is metformin, um, as I understand it. I'm not a clinician, but I'm being told this. And, um, and so the 
the, the benefit that works the best, which is nutrition and fitness counseling, um, isn't even on the menu. Um, so there's a, a, a very wide gap here in, in my observation. And I'm, so I just wanted to make that observation that we are still worlds apart. Um, and uh, we've got to find ways on the board to make decisions to move people in your direction. Um, and I think the QHP population is just one, uh, one uh, platform upon which we can do that. And if you have any suggestions in that regard, I'd love to hear them. <coughs> One of the things that struck me while you were talking was we haven't talked about the self-management programs, and I think it's really important for us to be able to highlight that. That's something that Blueprint started, and so that we have healthier living workshops, we have um, pre-diabetes workshops, we have chronic pain workshops, we have um, the RAP programs for uh, mental health. You know, it's frustrating when a patient spends this amount of time in the doctors, and the doctors and the providers tell them you, you need to do this, but you got to walk the journey and be able to learn how to do that and build skill and, and capacity. And so I think that using this peer model and in a best practice approach where you have actually people that have the chronic diseases themselves that are teaching their peers and have support with a curriculum that, um, that is shown to work um, to actually build capacity and skills within the people themselves, it actually be, it, it's able to change behavior. And we've, that's, like I said, it started with the blueprint and, and continuing in support with, uh, with One Care uh, in, in an expectation that we actually work with groups of people to teach them and help build their capacity and they help teach each other. So thank you for bringing that up. Respond to that a bit. I mean, I've, I've, I think the blueprint is a, a wonderful network, um, and uh, I'm looking at the self-management workshops. And uh, in terms of pre-diabetes, um, when the number of people that start their workshops and finish, it's a very small number. I think in their 2017 um, uh, annual report, it was 184 people, whereas the health department will say there's a minimum of 27,000 people in Vermont that are pre-diabetic. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for paths to um, uh, kind of uh, encourage the flow of funds into the blueprint to expand their efforts uh, in terms of um, uh, their, their workshops and maybe align with the CDC program uh, for um, uh, pre-diabetes that um, uh, seems to be well received and, and evidence-based. So actually, the CDC and evidence-based model uh, was brought in for an article in the New England Journal of Medicine that had demonstrated that the lifestyle modification works better than metformin after a, a period of time. So one of the biggest things that we encounter with this model also um, is that we are, as a health system and physician, responsible of the health of our patient. But where is their responsibility? How do we succeed to tell an individual that you brought yourself to this level, I just mentioned the importance of lifestyle, and they're not willing to make the change? To what extent do we have to take the responsibility? So I, I certainly take a lot of time to educate with the coaching before we send them to make sure, and, and you have to be there and talk to them all the time. So the CHIP program, which is a little bit of a difference of the diabetes prevention program, they stick with us because we're there constantly and coach them in between session to make sure that they continue working with us. You know, so there are these organized self-management programs, but there's also self-management um, where you're engaging the patient in your office. And um, with the advent of health coaching and getting certified health coaches, and we're really excited in primary care up in St. Albans because um, we just hired two certified health coaches. These are going to be our partners to really, because what we find and what I have personally found is that patients respond better to services when you have them embedded in the practice, when they don't have have to take extra time out of their day to go to a program and things like that. So we're going to 
see where this goes. But um, you know, for our pre-diabetics, our patients that don't have any chronic medical problems but are perhaps overweight, and all these services that are not covered by insurances, we're going to have these health coaches embedded in our practice, and we as the physicians will be segueing, meet our health coach, see if they can work with you to identify what the barriers are that you're not able to achieve the goals that you want. And so obviously there has to be some motivation on part of the patient, but I think this is going to be a great asset, and I'm really looking forward to see where we are a year from now. Because legislators are here, if we could give them the opportunity first, if they have any questions or comments, because I know that they're on limited time, time schedule. They're surprisingly quiet. <laughs> 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 legislators? And if you could say your name, who you represent, and direct any comments or questions through the chair of the board. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jill Olson. I'm the executive director for the VNAs of Vermont. We represent Vermont's home health and hospice agencies. Um, and I just wanted to, I guess through you, thank the panel for, for this morning. Um, I just wanted to connect uh, one policy dot that I don't think I've, I've heard touched on but not fully referenced, which is those um, uh, delivery system reform dollars that are actually looking to be cut right now in our um, in our state appropriation. And what I'm concerned about is that we haven't really fully invested in this reform process so that we can make that leap from where we are now to the more capitated model. I think Dr. Leffler touched on that problem where the system isn't yet fully capitated. So what that means is something like the longitudinal care program that, um, that Judy talked about that is really successful and that I think we should be spreading all over the state and we're going to work to do that. It's a little bit hard to get programs like that off the ground because there's not a whole lot of dollars to pay for the first try. And in fact, when Judy started that program, it was through a grant. So she was able to demonstrate the value of it through a grant to then make the leap to actually embedding it as a program. So without um, OneCare having some of that flexibility to have some dollars to make investments to show these kind of interventions can work, I think we're going to continue to struggle with moving as fast as we'd like to move. Again, your name, where you're from, and comments. Thank you. I'm Kim Fitzgerald. I'm the CEO for Cathedral Square, and we are the statewide administrators for the SASH program. And I did want to make a comment today, obviously, in, in addition to what all the panelists said, um, because I think SASH is a perfect example of the capitated rate, and we have the flexibility. Um, so I did want to just talk about um, our recent results. Um, we've obviously been very successful under the Blueprint for Health, but now we are funded for the majority of our staff on the ground through one care. So um, we had our latest results in August of this past summer, and it again is showing that we're reducing Medicare expenditures by over $1,200 per person per year. In addition, these evaluations went a little bit further to demonstrate that we are reducing Medicare ER expenditures, as well as specialist visits, as well as duly eligible participants are reducing their Medicare expenditures as well. And so we're obviously hitting all of the aims of the 
male pair model through those results. Um, and so we continue to hope to do more of that. In addition, I want to call out um, a mental health pilot that um, One Care funded this past year in collaboration with Howard Center and with SASH. And um, we embedded a mental health clinician Howard, us hired by Howard in two housing locations, so where people live. And within the first year, found immediate re positive results, including a lot of male participation, which is usually the hardest cohort to reach, um, as well as we found that the um, able to see the person quickly, usually same day, which in crisis situations can absolutely de-escalate a situation. We also found a lot of group programming, so again, that population-based approach is really successful and efficient. And lastly, there we also have prevented evictions as a result of having the clinician right there, which then, of course, prevents homelessness. So I also have to, since I have the mic and have the opportunity, I do want to address the legislators as well, because you may have heard that the uh, governor's budget has a huge cut to SASH um, in, in the Dale budgets, 55%, or almost $541,000. And that would be devastating to the program, would really, um, really wipe it out and um, hurt it over the long haul, of course. And one of the claims is that one care should just pick it up, which is not um, something they're able to just do. Um, so I would just advocate for the um, legislators to support full funding of SASH and the Dale budget and to know that we are also, as many other community service partners, we are reducing those that are in nursing homes. We're preventing or delaying admissions to nursing home, which is saving the state of Vermont a lot of money. So thank you. Just your name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Mark Tully. Uh, I came up here from Brattleboro today <clears throat> to be in solidarity with Disability Awareness Day until I found out this corporate advertisement was happening. I want to object to the funneling of the people's money to a for-profit corporation. I want to object to the privatization of Vermont's health care system. Okay? I'm glad all these outcomes sound fabulous. Every single one of them is because a corporation is pumping money into this pilot program. Uh, coordination of care, training of staff, uh, making life easier for primary care providers. None of that requires corporate privatization. Why it's happening now is one, this board is not funneling the people's money into pilot programs for public solutions to this thing. You're funneling to a for-profit corporation. And every single one of you have been talking about outcomes. It's money this corporation has pumped into your practice to hire staff, uh, trainers. It's all like, how much money or how healthcare will be rationed once this pilot program is over, once all of this cash to make a big shiny pilot program is over, is completely uncertain. Um, and I also, you know, I've heard from and about independent providers who choose, uh, who would like to stay independent. There's nobody on this board. This is not a report from the field. There are not a variety of provider experiences as there are out there. This is, a, I don't, I don't doubt your credentials or the veracity of your stories. I thank you for your service. You all seem fabulous people. There's not a single provider who's being hurt by this, and there are providers being hurt by this. And I find the exuberant advocacy coming from some members of the board to be distasteful and an abrogation of your duty to be a neutral arbiter of the business before you. Thank you. Again, any of the legislators before you have to go, or? Oh, do you have a comment? Oh, that's OK. And, but I just wanted to check any. I, I think. Let me go over here, and then I'll come back. This is a hard job. <laughs> it's good exercise. It is. Hi, I'm Deb Richter. I'm a practicing family physician in an independent practice that is not involved with the all-payer model. And I must say that you've made the wonderful case that primary care is essential. And I don't think anyone would, would disagree with that. I think we also, you're, you're alluding to the social determinants of health. 
My problem with all of this, and I see this every single day, is the fact that it's supposed to be patient-centered, yet we've left out a major piece, the fact that many of my patients have rising copays and deductibles and are now dropping out of care, inclu including addiction care, by the way, and going back to the street because they're suddenly going from Medicaid to private insurance, which has huge deductibles for them. And they begin to say, well, gee, I can, I can get this stuff cheaper on the street and I don't have to pay for your services. So it seems to me that until this is the cart before the horse, I, 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 you are all laudable, and I, it's wonderful the efforts that you are making, and I know you have the best of intentions. But until we get everyone in the system, into primary care, they're stopping themselves at the door. If people that are supposed to be seeing me are diabetics four times a year, I'm seeing them once a year sometimes because they can't afford the co-pays and the deductibles. There is a bill sitting in the House that I'm hoping that Chairman Lippert will bring, uh, bring up and I'm hoping it'll pass the legislature, H-129, universal primary care, which would publicly fund primary care for all Vermonters, including outpatient mental health and substance abuse services. I don't see how we could, any of us, we've made the case that primary care is essential, how we could not be in favor and have this be the first thing that we address. Because if you really want primary care doctors to want to stay in primary care, because we have a problem, a lot of us are retiring, a lot of us, I think a third of the population of the primary care, um, are Dr. Haddock's age, my age, right? We're going to retire in the next few years. So if we want people, you have to make sure that your patients all have the same health care. Instead of us, you know, you know, someone with private insurance getting more services than somebody with Medicaid or whatever, depending on the service. So I think that we really need to discuss that, and that needs to be something, and I hope the legislators have heard me. I know, I know I talk loud, but anyway, thank you. <laughs> I will work my way over here. Your name and where you're from? My name is Julie Tesler. I work at Vermont Care Partners, representing designated and specialized service agencies. Um, I thought these were great presentations. And of course, I listen for mental health. And it comes up a lot. And many of the complex cases are people with mental health conditions. Um, and the care coordination is a collaborative effort, and it's going very well. But one of our challenges is our workforce. And I know there's a challenge with primary care and nursing workforce, too. But especially master's level clinicians, that's a, a critical service. So so we get referrals or we're doing care management, but we have vacant positions. Um, it's harder for us to really meet people's needs. So I hope, and I know you've looked at workforce, so I hope you keep that on the radar screen that we need to look at um, investing in Vermont's workforce and in designated and specialized service agencies. For us, we're, it's, much of it is around the rates and what we can pay for our staff and attracting those st staff. So. Um, Finding a balance and how those resources are allocated and making those investments will really make a difference in helping us provide those community supports and keeping people well. So thanks for listening. I want to make sure I get back over here. And let me do the legislators first because they are on a timeline. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Mari Cordes. I'm a registered nurse at UVM Medical Center and a representative from Lincoln, Bristol, Moncton, and Starksboro, and on the House Health Care Committee. Um, I have a question about quality measures um, and how how are you, what data are you using to measure um, your progress or um, opportunities for progress? What benchmarks? I, in one chart I saw, it looked like um, in 2017 the Medicaid benchmarks, there were actually no benchmarks for specific categories like 30-day follow-up for um, substance use or mental health, and yet um, the, the progress was scored um, at the highest level, even though there was no benchmark to compare it to. Um, but that, those were just Medicaid benchmarks. Do you use other benchmarks? Do you have data for us um, later than 2017? I'm looking at Steve because I'm thinking you might have the answer. 
So um, there's something called the ACO33, which are measures you're uh, talking about, and they're a mixture of reporting measures. On some of them, early on, you get credit for just being able to report them, being able to gather them, which is not always easy, going out to our primary care offices and pulling that data in, and some of them are outcome measures. And they roll up to an overall score, and there, there's measures for Medicaid, Medicare, and commercial. And depending on the data lag, there's different times the data comes in, we can report them at different rates. But I know that for 17, all the Medicaid data is finished, and I th you must be counting, some of those were just for the first year, strict reporting measures. And then over time, you look and see how hard was it to report, how much of a burden it, is it on our doctors to gather that information, and are we getting what we want out of it? And then they're supposed to change over time. We're supposed to adjust them to make sure we're gathering Ultimately, what you want is good outcome measures. We want them too, because that's really how you can show over time that you know the third part of this model is our Vermonters healthier over the next five years in this program. And there are a number of measures that talk about access to primary care, a chronic health illness, a chronic disease burden for the for the state of Vermont for Vermonters, um, mental health visits after an ER uh, stop. Those kind of things are critical. So we do have data, and one care could definitely come and give you a presentation, but. The data that we have for each payer is at different time frames because when they get the data back. Hope that answers. Yeah, it's just the part between getting a positive score for reporting versus an actual outcome I think might be unclear, at least to the public. So um, we could come back and show you some stuff on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Again, your name and where you're from. Hi, my name is Ethan Park. I'm just representing myself. I hope my <clears throat> question here is not too tangential, um, but I learned that uh, late last year, CMS and the Office of the Inspector General granted the Vermont Medicare ACO initiative and the all-payer model waivers from certain federal fraud and abuse laws. And while I understand the goal of building these systems of integrated care, I think that's a very laudable goal. Um, it just kind of raises a red flag for me, uh, the fact that the federal government uh, would allow an ACO to regard, disregard laws that were put in place to protect patients and save the public health care dollars. Uh, the waivers that um, Vermont got involved the um, physician self-referral law, the federal anti-kickback law, and uh, something that's called the patient engagement incentive law. And so my questions are from a patient's perspective. How can I be assured that a referral is being made or a medical procedure is being recommended that is in my best medical interest as a patient and not merely in the best financial interest of the ACO? How can I be assured that my doctor or clinic or the ACO itself is not receiving a kickback when I choose a specialist within the ACO? How can I be assured that a special service or item of care given to me is not meant to coerce me into staying within the ACO network? Congress put fraud and abuse statutes into place for a reason shortly after the enactment of Medicare and Medicaid. They are there to prioritize care over profits and to save the taxpayers money. I know that these waivers have been issued to ACOs all across the country, not just Vermont. But it is arguable, in my opinion, whether ACOs should be exempt from these laws. Why not focus on full disclo disclosure to patients, transparency of financial relationships between providers and between providers and payers? and coordination of care that is a matter of public policy, totally free of opaque preferential networks, provider paybacks, and beneficiary inducements. Thank you. So there's a lot of questions there, and I'm not sure if we can answer all of them, but maybe, maybe Mike. Mike Barber, and I also um, want to recognize Ina Backus is in the audience as well, not to put her on the spot, but Director of Healthcare Reform in Vermont, and participated in the negotiations on this waiver. But I think I can turn this over to Mike Barber, our general counsel. Uh, yeah, I would just say, actually, Mr. Bart covered it, that these waivers are not unique to Vermont. They were issued to Vermont because we have kind of a unique program, but these waivers are 
issued for the Medicare Next Generation program, for the Shared Savings program. They basically enable um, the kinds of arrangements that an ACO needs to um, have to do to do these things. Otherwise, federal law would prohibit a lot of this. So. And I would also add, um, as part of the oversight of the Green Mountain Care Board for the Accountable Care Organization, One Care Vermont, the uh, very transparent nature of our budget process and in-depth nature, as um, I think many on our staff and um, folks at the ACO could attest to. And I, I'll turn it over to Dr. Leffler. So it's a great question. And um, what I would say is that um, the reason that these were put into federal statute is because at times people were abusing the system and were self-referring. The easiest example I can give you of why this is a good thing to have these is that I'm an ER doctor by training and for the vast uh, most of my career um, we would have someone come in who very clearly needed to be admitted to a nursing home but in the past because some doctors owned nursing homes and would self-refer patients to those nursing homes the federal government made a waiver that you couldn't send someone from an ED directly to a nursing home. I had to admit them to the hospital for three days. There was cost to the patient to do that. It wasn't good for the patient, for their family, for the hospital, for anyone before they go to a nursing home. Um, that was put in place because there were some bad actors out there. We have a waiver now that lets us send people directly from the emergency department when appropriate to a nursing home, which we don't own. It's better for the patient. It's better for the system because they're not using up an inpatient bed. I think I saw that Porter sent more than 30 from their ED now direct to nursing homes. That is good for everyone. So I will also tell you that every time one of these waivers comes up in front of the One Care Board, we have to we have a lawyer that sits with us and make sure that we are fully compliant with the spirit of what's supposed to be happening and no one is personally benefiting in any way from following these waivers except the patients. I'm going to just make my way around here. I saw a couple of hands in the back. <coughs> my exercise yeah. Hi, I'm Richard Slusky, um, and I'm now retired. I was the director of payment reform, uh, working with the Green Mountain Care Board and helping in what way I could to help develop the pro some of the programs that we have today. And I, I just want to say that um, it's really gratifying to hear all of you uh, speak about um, the ACO, the progress that's being made. When we were developing this program, there was a great deal of concern about the consolidation of services through one ACO and whether that would uh, tend to um, pull money away from community-based services and consolidate it into the hospitals and, and not be distributed in the ways that you've all demonstrate is actually happening. Um, and it's, it's great to hear some of you say, this is the best time I've ever had in healthcare. Um, you know, that, that, and this is on a community level. And my mantra when I was talking about this was always to say how we get paid matters. And I, I think, you know, if we pay fee for service, you're going to see more volume, more services, more things being done, probably some of which are unnecessary. I think it's certainly been proven to be the case. If you move toward value-based payments, you're going to see a shift in motivation to keep people healthy. And I think that's what you all are talking about today. And it's, it's nice to see that that's actually happening in Vermont. I'd also say, in, in terms of just one quick comment, I know those of you who know me know I'm full of stories, so I won't, I won't tell a lot. But one thing, you know, when we talk about the ACO being a for-profit entity, you have to distinguish between a for-profit corporation that actually distributes its profits to shareholders or other corporate owners, as opposed to a corporation all of the hospitals in Vermont are not for profit. And I believe all the agencies associated, for the most part, with the ACO are not for profit. So this is an organization that if it does generate margin, it will reinvest that margin in services. It's not sending money to individuals 
or to shareholders. And that, that's a big difference. And I, I think uh, you need to keep that in mind when you make that argument. So I just want to congratulate you all. It sounds like it's going well. I hope the board and the legislature will continue to support these efforts. It is going to require investment, continuing support, continuing commitment to make this work. And I just hope you all will continue that support. Thank you. Thank you. And one more question, Chair, is that okay? Can we do one more? Yep. You understand it? Dale Hackett. Um, one, I always love the spirit of Vermonters. They're very colorful. They're always participating, in, and they're exceptional in how they go back and forth and work together, in a sense, as a team. Um, my question, much of the data that the ACO has, I have a question around do they ever doubt what the data is telling them because it's more inductive in nature and therefore can lead to false conclusions? I'm not invalidating the value of data. I'm only questioning how it gets interpreted and how careful we are in interpreting the data. The other one would be, I didn't hear much about workforce issues, if they're actually struggling to get the people in order to do the work. And then someone suggested that the coordination of care depends more on the skill building within the patient, if I heard it correctly in order for the primary care delivery to really be effective. Perhaps I'm paraphrasing, or I thought I heard something along that line suggested. I'm going to leave it at that, because I see one head shaking yes, another one shaking no, and so I think I should stop right there. Once again, you've done your duty of asking the best questions and comments. So, Chair Mullen, I... So, I, I wasn't watching the panel, so I didn't know who was shaking their head. <laughs> I know, but whoever was doing this, you have a comment to a couple of uh, Dale's questions. I think. I had been shaking my head, yes, in that um, helping people to develop skills, I think, is often a first step in um, helping folks to be more in charge of their own health care. Um, so while we may have a goal of reducing someone's, or you know, having their blood sugars under better control or that they will um, stop going to the ER and start going to primary care, really we have to go to people and say, what do you need and how can we help you in developing the skills that you need to to accomplish the goals that you've identified. And any of our goals around, you know, again, utilization or um, uh, management of chronic conditions, those are all really secondary. We have to find out what folks find important and work with them on developing those skills first. So that was the yes shaking. I don't know if there was other shaking that needs a microphone. So while, while the panel's looking around to see who wants to speak next, I want to follow up on a point that Dale made, and that is the workforce. And what we continually hear in the budget process is that hospitals are paying twice as much to employ uh, a traveler or a local than they would a um, fully employed member of their team. And we also hear some comments that the quality may not be as good because that person isn't as familiar with the equipment in a given hospital or um, knowing all the services that are available in the community. And so um, I try to label it as the, the number one issue facing health care. I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to uh, um, try to tackle this, but it, with all the legislators in the room, there's so much that needs to be done in workforce. If we don't get started soon, it, there's going to be a crisis, and then we'll be reacting to something that we should have reacted to years ago. 
Um, I'd like to <clears throat> make just a couple of comments about the nursing workforce. There's definitely a shortage in Vermont, and there's a shortage in the nation. And um, I had the opportunity to be talking to uh, a group of our personal care attendants, that, because at, at Home Health we also do some entry le have entry level positions. We about have about 200 personal care attendants who do long term care services. And I was at a, a meeting with them just to ask them, you know, what were the barriers that prevented them from doing the kind of care they wanted, how we could support them. Um, and several of them said, geez, they wanted to go on to be nurses, but there was no way they could do it because they can't afford nursing school. And they have to, you know, many of them were sing single women with children, so they needed to work full time at 11 $12 an hour, and there was no way they could go to nursing school. So I think there's an opportunity in Vermont. I think there are people who are recognizing what good work nursing is and other health professions, and they want to do it, but they can't afford it. I would really like to see Vermont. I mean, there, many of the things we've talked about, whether it's uh, you know, poor nutrition, uh, lifestyle habits, and all of that. A lot of this needs to be addressed by Vermont as a system change. It's not, you know, I really believe in the responsibility of individuals and people needing to, you know, uh, take charge of their own health. But a lot of our systems don't, whether it's, you know, the availability of, of junk food or, you know, the inavailability of walking paths, um, that we as a state, there's a lot we could do to help promote um, good health. But anyway, I digress. Uh, so the workforce issue, I really believe that we need to uh, look at other ways we can fund um, people to be able to get nursing education, and then they would guarantee they would stay and work in Vermont for a certain number of years. One of the problems for nursing also is that there aren't enough nursing instructors so that our nursing <coughs> educational institutions don't, you know, most have long waiting lists for people to get in. So, you know, they're, they're both system issues that I'd like to see us address. In terms of the workforce um, crisis that we really are seeing amongst um, primary care physicians, I previously was at a medical school as faculty, and when you have a graduating class and you only have maybe one student going into family medicine, we have a crisis. As someone alluded to, we have a lot of folks retiring, and um, with the cost of medical school education, what I hear from the students that I worked with was like, how can I go into primary care when they have half a million dollars in medical student loans and the salaries going coming out of school won't compensate the loans and having to support themselves. So this is, you know, I really don't have an answer, but um, I think if we want to change the workforce in terms of getting more students who may want to go into primary care but are thinking financially, how do I do this? I think we need to take a look at the bigger picture at the cost of medical school education. Well, I would just echo what they said about nurses. We can't hire a nurse. We run a ad in every place possible for eight months, and you might get one response. Partly because that's where independent and our salaries aren't quite as high. Uh, the second thing is you really can't hire a care coordinator now. Even UVM's having a hard time finding care coordinators, and some of them are nurses or some of them are social workers. But for this whole system, if we think it'll work, it's going to need more of those. One thing I would like to suggest, um, got my two, t two minutes here, so. Um, for loan repayment for physicians in this state, if you go to work for a 501c3 corporation and you have a 30-year loan, you pay the first 10 years and the subsequent 20 years payments are forgiven. And if you go to work for an independent practice, that's not the case. So um, I don't know if you all can fix that or not, but it's a big determinant of where in people end up practicing. The AHEC program is good. It go, you get one year, and then you got to reapply and figure out how to do that. And we've used that for both nurse practitioners, PAs, and physicians. But again, it's a yearly thing, and then you have to see what you can do. Whereas the program the 501c3s qualify for, you get 20 years of payments forgiven if you pay your first 10 years. And that would be nice, it would be nice to see that applied generally across the population or across the various practices. 
picking it out of the board. Anyone else on the panel? Okay. Did you? Well, I just I would. I would point to Dr. Paris about, you know, the hard work that um, we've done on recruiting for primary care and, and, uh, and we need more primary care providers and, and, it, and it's just so difficult and he could speak more eloquently about that and just also underline what Dr. Haddock said about giving us firstborn for a psychiatrist <laughs> and, you know, that it, it is true. We're, we're very fortunate. We have an excellent psychiatrist we can work with. but. Um, that was a gift, uh, you know, and it's and it's a rarity. Dr. Paris, do you want to have a few words or? Uh, I don't need the mic. Um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it, it is an ongoing challenge. Uh, Chairman Mullen mentioned that what what the board hears in the budget hearings of what our traveler costs have been, our experience has been a quarter of a million dollars up to 1.2 million dollars in just three years of traveler costs, and it's not just traveling nurses. It's travelers in, a, in the tech positions, lab techs, radiology techs, respiratory therapists, PT, OT, you, you name it. There's travelers everywhere. So we're, we're, it, it is our job to uh, think creatively about what we do. We're investing in workforce housing. We just bought a condo last week, and mm -hmm. the hospital did. We're going to put folks that are new to the area and waiting to buy a house in that condo and subsidize their rent. We're, we, you know, a lot of us who run older, smaller hospitals have campuses with buildings we don't use anymore, so we renovated one and made two apartments out of it. So I think we have to think that way. Um, I think the next step uh, for the smaller hospitals is to think like UVM has, I'm speaking about complex patients, what have been described as hospital-dependent patients. Uh, I think of what UVM did with um, housing for some of their complex diabetics and actually um, talk about addressing social determinants of health, actually providing some housing uh, for some of the complex or hospital-dependent patients that we have are, are things we're going to uh, to look at. And I, I didn't introduce myself. Uh, Joe Paris uh, succeeded Richard at Manuscopy Hospital with one person in between as CEO, also chief medical officer, and an internist who spent the first half of his career in primary care. So see things from, from all sides uh, here. Also a believer in what Lucky is trying to do. Great. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. So, again, I just want to uh, thank the panel. I know that uh, um, you'd probably much rather be working with the patients in the field and uh, getting results than come, come here, but it's important that people hear what's actually happening out in the field. And I especially want to thank Dr. Holmes for putting this together. I don't think it's an advertisement. I think it's an educational uh, event that people need to get the feedback from the field to make sure that the hypothesis is being proven correct. And uh, I think that um, there's a, a lot, lot more work that needs to be done to be successful, but we're making progress. And I think at times we don't focus on progress as much as we do on all the uh, things that are left to be done. So uh, I'm very grateful to hear from people out in the field that are really seeing some good positive results. And uh, otherwise, we'd be just wasting our time for the last couple of years. So um, this is very good. And um, I just want to especially thank the um, legislators who, who came today. Uh, being a former legislator, I know this uh, week before town meeting is a crazy time as everybody's trying to get bills voted out and such. Um, but um, it's an interesting year when I look out there and I see so many new faces on the health care <coughs> committee. Um, you know, you are the future. You are the ones that have to um, get the message to your colleagues at the State House. Um, and again, I just want to uh, take my opportunity to do the sales pitch that really we need to address workforce or we're really going to be in a very bad uh, situation. So with that, I'm going to um, recess this meeting till 1 o'clock. And again, thank you everyone very much. So we're going to call the meeting back to order. Um, the first uh, item of business is the minutes of Wednesday, February 20th. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the minutes of Wednesday, uh, February 20th, without any deletions, additions, or corrections. 
Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. So the first item this afternoon is the discussion of the qualified health plan um, plan design. And with that, I'll turn it over to our friends from DIVA. And, oh, yes. And yeah, yeah. So uh, Addy, Dana, we have a court reporter here for the next presentation, uh, which is uh, in part on the ACO's request for budget adjustment. So we'll um, let you know, obviously, when uh, to start. Yeah, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of re relief over on that side. <laughs> Thank you. Whenever okay. you're ready. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, I'm Dana Houlihan from Diva, returning from last week, and I'm here with Addie Stremelo, also from Diva. Um, do I have Julie Pepper and Brittany Phillips from Wakely on the phone. And create an exit announcement have been turned off for all meeting participants. Well, and, uh, there's Sean, Sean's on as well. Hi, Sean. Sean Sheen from Diva. Do we have Julie and Brittany from Wakely Consulting? Uh, yes, both of us are on. Can you hear us? We can. Thank you. Just confirming. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to start with uh, responses to the questions that we received um, since last week when we were here. So, um, yeah, if you would turn to the 29, please. So the first, yeah, don't want to make anyone seasick. But, yeah. Okay, so the first question was around the uh, the placement of the chiropractic and uh, physical therapy co-payments co for 2020 and how they've moved from the previous year and was there consideration of going with and in 2020 the requirement for max 7 is that the co-payments be placed at one, a range of 125 of the 125 percent of the uh, primary care office visit and 150%. We have um, proposed placing them at or near the 150% mark. So starting with the silver plan, or to to uh, give a little context of our discussion, there was discussion about how to where, how and where to place these co-payments. Um, understanding that it's, it was a transitional year for both chiropractic that last year was aligned with the primary care visit and in 2019 the physical therapy co-payment was still aligned with the specialist visit. So in most instances um, it's a decrease for physical therapy and in most instances it's a it's an increase for the chiropractic for 2020. Um, so there was some discussion about where to land and we wanted to, we thought going somewhere in between where the primary care office visit and specialist visit was kind of splitting the difference was the best course and that looked like about the 150% level. Um, I do want to point out, moving up a bit, that in the platinum plan between 2019 and 2020, where again, this was not required in Act 7, but we elected to make a change. It's a, an actual um, decrease proposed for 2020 in, in terms of what it would have been. If it had stayed aligned with the specialist office visit, ah, what I know. That's what I get for taking. <laughs> That's what I get for taking my glasses off. I apologize. <laughs> okay, pointer. For 2020, we propose moving the PCP office visit from 10 to 15, specialist visit from 30 to 40. So if we hadn't made any changes, the um, or if we had kept the same pattern, the physical therapy and chiropractic visits would have been at 40. Um, 
so we went to 20 with them this year in our proposal, so it's um, a, you know, a decrease, just wanted to point that out. So I think the main question that we had, Dana, on that is, if you had gone to the lower end of the range, would it have thrown it, thrown it out of the uh, actuarial value range that's required? So we, I did ask Wakeley to confirm that, and um, in 2020, if we made, if we went to the 125 percent, they would still be in compliance with the AV, the three plans in question, um, which was the silver deductible and the two bronze deductible plans would still be in compliance. The chiropractic services, in fact, are not part of part of the AV calculator. The physical therapy services are, but we would still stay compliant. There would be a very modest uh, premium impact by going to the 125 level. And did Wakely give you an estimate of what that premium impact would be? Very small. It's actually 0.05 percent. So given all the negativity that we received last year being accused of not following the um, first statute regarding chiropractic, why wouldn't we try to go to that lower end and not subject ourselves to uh, what I'm sure will be some intense uh, accusations again this year? I did confer with the three kind of primary stakeholder groups with yeah. this question. With, and that is Blue Cross, MVP, and the um, Vermont Legal Aid. Um, I didn't get a, an absolute consensus about this, but the strong leaning two of the three stakeholder contingencies supported staying with the current um, proposal for uh, avoiding the premium impact, small as it is, and landing somewhere in between um, where the specialist and PCP visit would be, and we of course want to move the uh, uh, physical therapy and chiropractic co-payments in unison. So, you know, and then bottom line is that we, we can't accommodate this uh, change if, the, if that's the wishes of, of the board. Okay, thank you. Can you talk to the, the goal change? I know that you don't have to stay within that, but I thought the chiropractic on the gold um, I think it was maybe on the alternative plan. Was yes. Uh, the recommended plan brought the chiropractic and physical therapy co-payments to 150%. And again, that was optional, which in fact is just a, a lateral move. This is 2019, would stay the same. Um, for gold and platinum, the uh, Act 7 doesn't apply, so we felt that we did have the discretion to bring these up in the alternative plan in, ch in exchange for a slightly lower increase in the um, medical out-of-pocket maximum and a slightly better um, premium impact here, but again, this was the um, recommended plan design. So it's, it's correct that this is over 150%, but our understanding from Act 7 was that, you know, that requirement didn't apply and so that we would have that discretion if we, we chose to. But we would have to go to that plan if we had the restriction on the um, 8,000 or the 8,200. When would we go to the alternate design plan? We don't, we wouldn't have to. Okay. We, we're, we are you know, proposing the uh, plan of design in the middle column. Yeah. We just always kind of show the runner-up from the stakeholder group in terms of exactly. an alternate design. So yeah. we don't have to switch to that. Are there any other questions on that? Um, so we, you know, bottom line, we can accommodate that just um, depending on the wishes of the board. Okay. Um, the next question I wanted to go to was around the um, timing and contingency around that maximum out of pocket. Um, when that would go kick in and so forth. Just wanted to, um, again, I apologize for the switches here. When I gave a 
brief over high level overview of the remaining timeline items. Um, I want to point out here it's estimated that would be made available to us and we would know in April, which is awkward timing, it's often that way. But uh, Julie and Brittany, correct me, are, um, isn't the usual timing about 90 days from when the draft payment notice comes out, which this year was in January? Yeah, this is, I think, and I could be getting the specifics wrong, they have 60 to 90 days after the public comment period, and so I think that that's kind of our, that's kind of that April time frame. Okay. And also, um, Brittany or Julie, if you wanted to review that slide 21 where you outlined the contingency plan around the affected bronze plans in silver. I'm on slide 21 if you wanted to take a look at that. Yeah, this is Brittany. I can go through that. So in the if in the final regulations, the <clears throat> annual out-of-pocket maximum moves from 8,200 to 8,000. Um, the recommended plan designs that would be impacted, as we've shown them here, are the uh, bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit and the silver and bronze uh, high deductible health plan. So should the final regulations um, reduce the, the out-of-pocket maximum to 2,000 on both uh, HDHD plans, we recommend moving the we would move the embedded out of box maximum um, from 8,200 down to 8,000 um, in those two plan designs. And beyond that, no other changes to the plan designs would be required. Um, we would meet the AD requirements uh, with that lower limit. For the bronze deductible plan with the pharmacy limit, um, the recommended plan design would not meet the continue to meet the AV requirements with an $8,000 out of pocket maximum rather than $8,200. So in that case, what we're proposing and what we're um, asking the board to approve is that should that happen, we would move then to the alternative plan design, um, which is shown on slide. Looks like 35 from last week's slide deck. Um, so, in order to meet the requirements with an $8,000 out of pocket maximum, we would need to increase the medical and pharmacy deductible um, further from the recommended plan design um, from $6,000 to $6,350, and for the medical deductible, and from $1,000 to $1,350 for the pharmacy deductible. So I hope that answers your question. Our time, estimated timing is April, and this was, these are the changes that um, we anticipate and how we would implement them with that final request for the you know, ability to just make that substitution if, if we need to. Any other questions on that? Okay. Um, I think I'd ask Wigley to address this one as well. The question around the trend figures that were provided for um, the 19, uh, 2019 to 2020 within the calculator. Sure, this is Brittany again. Um, so the federal calculator um, is based on data from the underlying data is from 2015, um, and each year they trend that data forward um, to try and reflect the uh, medical and pharmacy claims of 2020. So the trends that were provided there um, from uh, 2018 to 2019 and from 2019 to 2020, there was a, a note that those are, are quite high. Um, these numbers are from CMS. Uh, they're part of the actuarial value calculator, which we're required to use to determine the metal levels for these plans. So there's not really any discretion about the trends that um, are used in determining this. Um, I would kind of uh, say that I think Julie mentioned this in, in last week's meeting that the, the actuarial value calculator is really meant to bucket uh, plans into these metal levels and. Um, kind of try and make it easy, an easier comparison to 
for like plants. So, you know, all the platinum plants have a similar AB, the gold plants have a similar AB, those kinds of things. It's really meant to do that bucketing and not necessarily, you know, the pricing, um, calculate the pricing or, or those types of, of things. Um, those will be done by the carriers um, using their specific data, um, general information data. So they, the trends that they use to actually determine premiums may be, you know, lower than those shown here. This is really just for the, the calculator and what we're required to use to do that bucketing into the different metal levels. Does that help answer that question? Yeah, it does. Thanks. Okay, I think we're good on that. Um, so I guess in terms of the written questions, I just wanted to acknowledge the um, questions proposed by um, Member Pelham about the kind of alternative services and you know, acknowledge that that's not something that we can deal with for 2020. And in fact, the, the first suggestion would require um, addressing or changing our uh, benchmark plan, the essential health benefits benchmark plan, which is not impossible, but uh, you know a longer-term effort that we would need to do with multiple inputs. So, so yeah. um, I uh, through Mike sent over two requests, and one has turned into a question, and one into a conundrum. <laughs> um, so you, I think. Um, from what I heard is that you were addressing the conundrum. Um, I uh, Just a little background on that. I um, last Late last fall read an article in the Times Argus about this group um, at, called the Vermont Center of uh, Health and Behavior at UVM and they had just gotten this NIH funding uh, to do um, evidence-based uh, clinical studies on different uh, uh, solutions to healthcare problems and behavior. And so I went over and met with them, and uh, this $31 million grant was a um, renewal of a $31 million grant that they had before, and they have all these clinical studies uh, that they do. And <clears throat> we started talking, and it was very clear to me that they knew a lot about clinical studies, but had no idea about um, kind of, uh, and, and literally no idea about how healthcare in Vermont which is something that um, you know, I'm pretty deep into now. And at the other end, I didn't have any uh, uh, experience with doing clinical studies. Um, and so I asked them the question you know, of the uh, kind of thinking that uh, when, when I look at these plans, that uh, somebody can go and get a preventive um, um, consult with, with their primary care physician. Um, but then if they, for example, uh, were told that they're pre-diabetic, uh, there really wasn't, you know, a solution to that problem other than going through uh, the hoops of copays and um, deductibles to get to meta metformin, and uh, I, I always mispronounce that. But um, so um, I was just thinking, are there ways to put um, uh, some uh, preventive measures that um, uh, clearly have a, a you know, a, a healthy present value um, and are the right thing to do. And uh, they said there certainly are. And for example, diet and exercise for pre-diabetes pre is one. And so my thought was, um, and this is the conundrum, was that um, is there a way to use the 2020 process? Because, you know, I realize that we're into the game on 2020. Uh, but to, to look toward 2021 to see if, um, some of these uh, um, evidence-based benefits, and the, the folks at the Vermont Center emphasized three, of prediabetes, uh, smoking cessation for pregnant women, and uh, heart rehab as three that are just evidence-based and, 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 and helpful. Um, so I was, I was hoping that in this process, you know, that we could explore those, um, but I have learned from wiser minds that uh, the, the whole process of opening up the uh, benchmark plan uh, is a complicated one. It can be a complicated one. So I'm at a conundrum on that. I, I just, you know, I, I, I don't like voting for a plan where if somebody's pre-diabetic, they can't have as a benefit um, a, diet and exercise, a diet and exercise regime. 
uh, that they can go outside the system a little bit to the blueprint and, and maybe do some of their self-determination uh, efforts. So, um, but, so that's an issue that I'm just opening up to the board and I think I'm going to want to discuss <coughs> further. I know that you have a stakeholders process um, and um, would like to kind of uh, make our benchmark plan more consistent with what we heard this morning uh, uh, from the One Care folks in terms of of, of having it be supportive of, of preventive measures. Um, and so I'm, I'm not making a proposal at this point uh, in that regard. Uh, and I agree with you, it's not a 2020 issue. It, in my view, it was a 2021 issue, but trying to set the stage for that. The, um, the other uh, request had to do with just affordability. Um, and as you, you know from the work that you folks have done and Sean has done and uh, Agatha has done, that, um, uh, that the um, affordability from a premium point of view of these benchmark plans is, is, is pretty good, up to 400% of poverty. They're, the premiums are in the 4 to 5% range. But as soon as you get above the 400% um, um, of poverty, the um, and I said this the other day, the, um, uh, the premium jumps from um, uh, $82 at 350% of poverty for the low-cost uh, uh, bronze plan to 400% um, uh, at $150 a month, and then it jumps to $850 a month for, for the, uh, if you're at 450% of poverty. And I, I'm just looking for this process, and I, I think I heard it from Rev Answer at the last meeting, just to have the folks at DIVA, and I think Sean is, you know, very capable of this, to kind of price out, you know, what it would be to subsidize folks um, in increments between 400% of poverty and 450, and 450 and 500, so that their premium is no more than the 9.86% uh, of, uh, of their income. Um, I just, uh, because when you, you look at the deductibles for the silver plans and the bronze plans, uh, those have been growing at, at a double-digit rate since 2015. It's their 10 and 11% uh, average annual growth rates. And it's just uh, getting very expensive for a lot of people that don't have anybody else to help them. They're, they don't have an employer. They're out there on their own. And, um, and that small wedge of people in the individual market, um, uh, you know, hopefully we can find a path to help them. And, uh, but from my perspective, um, I just need to know, know a number. I mean, what what is this? Is it, is it a number that's out of reach and just not possible within a budget process, or is it something that we can focus on and help people with? Thank you. So we definitely have both questions, and we're happy to work with you on them. I think on the second one, we'd like to bring that into a conversation that um, is approaching the, the concern around affordability and the unsubsidized sliver of the market that you're addressing in a, in a kind of holistic way. So we'll be happy to be in touch about that once we get through this plan design stage. <laughs> Thank you. That, that, that's why the first one turned into a conundrum, because a wiser mind here and who has been through that process before of re-benchmarking uh, said that it's not as simple as uh, picking one uh, benefit as valuable as it might be and putting it uh, in play that there's a whole bunch of other forces that want their benefits put into play too and it gets very complicated. I think Tom though um, if you wanted to invite the academics to come and do a presentation before the Green Mountain Care right. Board so that we could all understand it better certainly if there's a way to um, save money by doing things differently right. I think everybody would be willing to look at that. Um, it was uh, kind of an epiphanal meeting that there were two sets of people kind of playing in the same park. And, uh, you know, I had little insight into their world and they had little insight into mine. They would love to come. And uh, so uh, I will work for you to make that happen. Great. Thank you. Were there other questions? Was that all the questions? Those were the ones that we received okay. in, in advance. So, so um, I guess I'll start then. Um, If in some and correct me anybody that that uh, if I get the uh, scenario wrong, but I remember at the end of last year um, after we had uh, gone through this same process a year ago that 
Um, certain legislators had accused us of not adhering to the law in the design, and they went to the, the drawing board, and they tried to create their own solution to make sure it didn't happen again. And one of the arguments that we were hearing at the time, for example, on chiropractic, is that um, the out-of-pocket could be um, the vast majority of what the actual charge is for the visit. And do you really want somebody um, going to um, a much higher cost provider that might be um, prescribing opiates or something like that just because it would cost them less out of pocket. So that was one of the discussions that I remember having. And I think the Senate version of the original draft had a limit of 50% of the um, actual office visit. And at the end of the day, the final language in the bill was the 125 to 150 range. And um, I just don't feel comfortable going through that whole exchange again. And it's not that um, I would feel uncomfortable if I felt positively that um, it was the right decision. But I, I just look at it, and I know some people uh, question chiropractic effectiveness, but when I owned a distribution business, I had two gentlemen who worked for me that um, would have missed a lot of work if they hadn't gotten to see their chiropractor. And so. Um, I've never had to see a chiropractor in my life, but as an employer, I saw how it enabled those two men to come to work on a daily basis and be very productive. So um, I would like, to, since it's not going to um, affect the actuarial value of the metal levels, to at least have the board consider it, but I don't know where the other members of the board are, so I'd need to hear from you. I'm happy to jump in. Um, it seems to me like this is a, a not uncommon occurrence where the legislative intent to, as you said, Kevin, ensure that the chiropractic copay was uh, accessible given sort of the frequency of visits and where those payment amounts are, kind of collides with the actual statutory text, which set a percentage amount. And it was very helpful to me to read um, the, a report that was submitted by DIVA last year to the legislature that kind of went through the ex where the expected copays would be, which um, are lower than where it turns out they ended up um, because of the way the AB calculator works and updates and stuff like that. But um, so I, that's really my preview to say I think I would be supportive of moving those copays for those three plans to the 125% level so that we are meeting the statutory And really what we're saying is rounding up to the nearest $5 increment, right, Dana? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd be supportive of that. What about other board members? Well, I will defer. I mean, I wasn't here for um, that whole um, Act 7 issue. And, um, whatever the consensus of the board was that has more experience with this than I, but I do want to support that. I, I'm also supportive of a lower copay for those. The, the one thing I would just say, just to be clear, is that at least when I did the math for the <coughs> bronze deductible without RX limit, it still puts it in the $50 range, which was, at least in terms of our one of our comments, uh, folks were hoping to see the copay be below that, which is not, I think, uh, is just not able to happen with the statutory language. So I just wanted to say that out loud so that uh, I don't think this fix, fixes uh, the problem totally, but I think it's what we would be able to do to help uh, meet the legislative intent within what they actually wrote. Okay, so before I open it up to public comment, I just want to state what I think might be the motion so that the public could comment on that. And I think what the motion might be, I never make the motions myself, so I'm just guessing here. Do you want me to try? But I, I think that what the motion would be, and Robin will, will uh, correct me if I'm incorrect, is that we would approve the designs as brought forth to us by DIVA with the one change being 
moving the um, co-pays for chiropractic and PT to the lower 125% range, rounding off um, to the $5 interval. Um, have I got that right, Robin? Yes, although I think when we, we the other piece we should include in the motion, which is unrelated to that issue, uh, would be the parameters discussed on slide 21, which would be approving the alternative uh, yeah. bronze deductible plan and uh, that approval for out-of-pocket changes as proposed regardless of whether uh, it fits within the prior guidance. Correct. Okay, does any board member have anything to say before we open it up to the public? If not at this time, I'll open the uh, discussion to the public for any comments. Please direct them to me. Yes, Walter. I just wanted to thank Tom for his comment about the um, over 400%. He made a really good point about people being out on their own, which is, I hear that all the time in my being out in the real world or beyond the bubble here. Yeah, where, you hit the cliff. Yeah, it's, that, that's something I think we should or should be pursued more. Other comments? Well, this is a very quiet crowd. Robin, would you like to make a motion? Yes, I would. Um, I would like that we move to approve the plan designs as, as brought forth by the Department of Vermont Health Access and described on page 20 of the slide deck with a change of moving the co-payments for chiropractic and and uh, physical therapy to 125% of the primary care co-payment, rounding to uh, a $5 increment, and to approve uh, the altern a move to a, the alternative plan design for the bronze deductible plan with the prescription drug limit uh, if the federal government uh, modifies the out-of-pocket maximum, making that a requirement and uh, to approve the out-of-pocket maximum changes as proposed on slide 20, regardless of whether uh, the previous guidance would require it or not. Okay, before we get a second, I just want to ask uh, Addie and Dana if we have we got it right. <laughs> yes, I just want, I would like one clarification. Was the motion to move the um, Cairo and PT co-payments for the three plans in question? Yes. Okay. Okay. Just want to make sure so I not, not across the board. Not Just across the board, but discussed. for the silver and bronze. And the two bronze. And the two bronze okay. deductible Thank plans. Thank you. Understood. Okay, is there a second? Second. I put up a summary of them. Okay, is there any uh, further discussion by the board? I would just like to say one thing before we vote, which is that um, I think this process is a hard process because it's it very technical, it's very bounded by federal law. Uh, quite frankly, the good part of it is that it's very well uh, done through a stakeholder process before it comes to us. Um, but quite frankly, the bronze plan. I call the, the population health management ratio. And it was a requirement that OneCare must fund its other population health management and payment reform programs, and specifically outlined the value-based incentive fund, the basic OneCare PMPM, the complex care coordination program, and the PCP comprehensive payment reform pilot in Rise Vermont at no less than 3.1% of its overall budget. 3.1% of the overall budget, uh, as, as calculated here, was both the benchmarks for our programs, the, t the gross targets, and other uh, operating revenues, essentially, that we receive as any contributions from the payers and the participation fees. And uh, that is the denominator in the calculation, and the numerator are those PHM expenses. So the reason I'm here today to discuss this one is that while all of the programs have been rolled out, in the design of the budget presentation, meaning that we've we've executed them in the in the way that they were presented to you uh, a little over a year ago, uh, for a number of reasons, the PHM spending ratio ended up being a little bit less than 3.1 percent. Uh, yes, 3.1 percent. I can explain those here. 
All right, so I mentioned that the, the measurement is calculated on the overall budget, so it uses that those benchmarks, and just from a, a functional standpoint, uh, this one's a, an interesting calculation in that both the numerator and the denominator are variables in this. The, the total budget changes with our benchmark and the attribution attrition we experience throughout the year, so that's a, that's a moving target too, and the actual PHM spending. Uh, the blueprint replacement funding was excluded from the budget order, so I've done my calculations accordingly. And these are current pre-audit financial estimates with the total overall budget, 626.8 million, and the total eligible PHM expense, 15.4 million. <laughs> the next grid down below itemizes the variance by the different initiative uh, that is applicable uh, to give you the context here of some of the numbers and then I'll explain them each and the primary driver behind each of these variances that we're seeing. So care coordination came in under the, the budget level. Uh, there's a couple themes that will be re recurring through the uh, talking points here. Uh, but two primary factors that drove this variance. The first was lower than expected attribution. We've talked about this here in the past where the Blue Cross in particular attribution came in uh, significantly lower than we had modeled in the budget. The other factor, uh, or one other factor, that is material is that we had a delayed start to the UVM Medical Center self-funded plan. Those payments began after Q1, so beginning in April. Uh, that, that causes really two delays. One is that we just didn't have any payments in the first quarter, but there's certainly ramp up for these new programs when you get your population into the high and very high risk categories. It takes some time for that level three engagement to take place. And that also resulted in some spending below the budget level. Um, last, I did, there's not a bullet point here, but we did have some estimates in the budget for that level three engagement of care coordination across all programs. I think it was a, a, a learning that we had, but and a pretty aggressive engagement rate and we haven't quite hit that rate. I think it's a good target for us to keep striving towards, uh, but our actual engagement has been a little bit below the estimate that was incorporated into the budget model. Next, we have the comprehensive payment reform pilot. This budget was $1.8 million, and that was really built to accommodate 10 practice sites that we had modeled as being in the network, in all three programs, and independent. Uh, we, we, only three ended up joining the pilot, which actually was an outcome that was totally acceptable and that there were three great sites, uh, two of which were really some of the larger, one of them was the largest, and then another one is at the upper uh, size threshold. So it's, it's not like we spent three-tenths of the funding, but it was three of the larger sites. And the, really the budget variance here reflects this lower participation in the program. There's a balance to be struck that I had, um, which was we had this budget number in here, we had fewer practices, absolutely want to invest in the practices, but need to do so in a sustainable manner. And if we unlocked the full budget amount to those practices, my fear was that we'd overfund this work in a way that wasn't gonna be sustainable long-term and it would result in us needing to pull back. I did not want that outcome. So we essentially left unfunded dollars on the table. That was part of the modeling I did to determine whether or not we could hit the reserve requirement kind of naturally as I knew there was gonna be some savings in this area and factored in that, that into the calculations. The value-based incentive fund, you'll note, is basically on budget, but just mentioning it here as it's one of the, the program components. Just to, to bring it up as we're getting close to our uh, 2018, having our final numbers in the books, we accrue and set aside in this uh, restricted account, essentially the full amount that we're required to hold aside by the contract. So it's a percentage of the total benchmark, so either half a percent or one and a half percent depending on the payer program. Ultimately, we get a score, quality score, at the end of the year, and that results in a certain amount being just paid out to the network, and then there's a remainder that is either uh, split and paid back to the payer or, and re or retained for investment um, in uh, for future quality initiatives. This number that I have in here is the full amount that we've accrued since we do not have that split, so just to make sure everyone knows and understands that piece. The last uh, category here are the community program investments. In here are the Howard Center SASH pilot with the embedded mental health and the SASH uh, housing programs. The regional clinical representatives, which we pay out to each community to have a clinical uh, liaison essentially with One Care Vermont. 
and then Rise Vermont. The, the biggest component of the budget variance was driz, driven by Rise Vermont and the rollout. Much of the funding that one care it pays for Rise Vermont and invest in Rise Vermont is related to local program coordinators that the, the entities in each community hire. And when they hire those positions, one care matches some of their salary to help roll out this uh, initiative statewide. So as those communities hired those positions, we began to match the funds and thus had much higher costs in the second half of the year. Yet there were still, uh, there was still a, a budget variance. The other component of the budget that came in under on the cost side was the Amplify grant. So basically once the program coordinator is in place in each community, they're coming up with ideas for how to engage in prevention and wellness in their area, and then we give them access to these Amplify grants to do innovative and fun ideas that Rise Vermont can speak to better than I can. And basically you gotta have the position in place first before these grants start. So we also started to see those escalate in the second half of the year. All right, so then the request ultimately, uh, when I look at where we landed 2018 with our preliminary numbers, we ended up with a PHM rate ratio of about 2.5%. So we're a little bit below that uh, threshold in the budget order. Again, the important point, at least for me, and this is why I'm, I'm confident coming here to say this, is that we've rolled out the programs in their designed manner and the manner of the budget uh, presentation that we submitted to you a year ago, a year and a half ago almost. Um, it was really, dri dri the variance or the not meeting this budget order was driven by changes to attribution, participation, and the timing of the program rollout, particularly for the self-funded and Rise Vermont. And then just in terms of the linkage between these two orders, in some cases the savings here did help us, uh, con did contribute to the reserves and avoided uh, further increases in the hospital uh, invoices. And I'll, I'll pause there. Okay, questions from the board? I'm just curious about um, the, the, the management of the budget for Rise Vermont. Is that a totally, is that in the hands of One Care? Do you see the whole picture in terms of what your contribution is to and what the local share is? Increasingly, yes. I, I'd say that in 2018, the exact path for Rise Vermont and, and the, the fork in the road was really to be a completely independent organization doing its own financial management, its own budgeting, but having some investments from One Care was one path. The other path was more of an integrated model into One Care's population health strategy and fulfilling that quadrant one objective. Uh, in 2019, it's much more towards that second Avenue, which is having Rise Vermont more integrated into One Care, and thus having uh, certainly more um, insight and control over the financial arrangement. I mean, the second one is what I understood it to be, and it yeah. uh, sounds like there's been some transitional issues uh, in 2018 into 2019. I would say that there's just the transition from being a singular community model to a statewide model uh, had just ordinary growing pains that you go through to figure out how you make this leap. So um, I got the impression that the Rise Vermont budget is came in hot relative to what the expectation was. Um, can you give me a sense of, of how much that was? The Rise Vermont budget if my memory serves me well, for 2018 was, I believe, 1.1 million. And I don't have this number in front of me, but I, I think the spending in that year was in the ballpark of 700,000. Thank you. Other questions from the board? Maureen? Yeah, um, I think just a comment, uh, you know, this one's a little more concerning because I totally understand that um, things didn't, you know, gear up as, as fast as they could have and things like that. And so, you know, you came in at a lower percentage. But um, we haven't seen your full 18 budget, but you're obviously alluding that you're going to be break even with providing for the reserve. And, you know, this wouldn't be the place 
we'd want to see savings. You know what I mean? Like, you know, we you say you've got four million in savings. Well, it went somewhere. I know part of it. I think your top line didn't come in as high as you thought, but you know, it's offsetting the reserves and legal and, and things like that. I mean, that that's where it's concerning, and that's why there's a percentage to kind of say we're staying at the 3.1 percent so that the dollars that you get in are being spent towards you know this really important program and. You know, so I guess for me, it, it really, it, it happened. You've closed your books, you're at 2.5%. There's not a lot that we can do, I think, about the past. Um, but it would really be a caution for the future that, you know, I definitely wouldn't want to put up, like, this contributed to reserves and things like that in the future, and that there were savings to these programs that offset other expenses, you know. So, I mean, that... I feel like we can't really do a lot about what happened last year, and I, you know, again, totally understand there was slow, slow coming to get some of the programs up and running. But it would have been great to have put those to the bottom line, or put it to reserve, or had it, you know, dry powder for this year, you know, for 2019, rather than to have spent it. So, you know, I feel like we can't do a lot about it. I mean, you know, you'd either be out of compliance on this, but that's what it was. Um, you know, and I think here, to Kevin's point of knowing more timely and things like that, because we didn't have an option to say, you're going to be favorable $4 million in this area. Where should that go? Or, you know, how do you do it? So, so I just think, for sure, for next year, we're really going to want to make sure that, or I'm going to want to make sure you're not utilizing this as a fund to offset overages in other expense categories. Yep, totally agree, and uh, I appreciate this, uh, and I did at the time that the budget order came through, and still do, appreciate this, what this is intending to do. I mean, we're, we're coming to you with a budget model that says we're going to invest in these areas in this fashion, and I think the budget order is intended to hold us to that and make sure that we do invest in those areas, and as, as promised in the budget uh, presentation, I have some ideas for how we can satisfy that in a little bit of a different way because I think this ended up being a technical thing rather than whether or not we actually fulfilled our obligations under these program models and uh, would welcome a conversation on that front but I totally agree with what you're saying. Thanks. Tom, one thing is that uh, we try to give uh, an open public comment period to the public and uh, timing wise the earliest that we could probably vote on this would be March 13th, it's a pretty packed day, which would take us to March 20th. We could do it on the 13th. Um, are there timing issues for you? Uh, really the only timing issue is, particular to the reserve component, uh, at some point, if if I need to get to 2.2, I need to invoice the hospital so that they know that this is coming. Um, I think it, based on that timing, it's okay. Uh, I can kind of inform them at the next finance committee that it's it will be resolved, and the date actually might align just fine with that. Um, so when you say the date, are you saying the 13th? Or the, the, third, uh, the 13th would be preferable. I'd have to look at the calendar to see if that's before our okay. next finance so committee. Late in the afternoon, we we'll get to it. No, no. Um, I think that would be fine. Okay. Are there other questions? So before I open it up to the public, I'll just uh, say that we will uh, be taking public comment, and that will be on the uh, site. So, uh, would anybody like to offer a comment or a question today? Dale. Yeah. I read it through last night, and sorry, it hit me as a puzzle. It, there was a lot of times where I was reading. Having trouble hearing you, Dale. Um, it hit me as a puzzle when I read this last night because I'm watching money flow around in the sense of we want to change what our reserves are. I'm not sure if I'm using the right term. We want to go to the 1.2 or 1.4 million from the 2.2 or 2.4 million. And I don't have any information as to design adequate reserve. I don't have anything that really gives me much guidance in terms of. Were you here when Maureen gave her explanation about the, um, 
um, either the swap or the reinsurance agreement, whatever you want to call it, and how that um, kind of took away from the need for the higher amount. I may have missed it because I came in late. Yeah. Sure. Quick, quick. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I'll actually give you two things. One, when they originally did their budget, they had in uh, 1.5 million reserve for re uh, allowance for reinsurance, and um, we increased the total reserve to 2.2 million, and still encouraged them to go out and get reinsurance. They did get reinsurance for 700,000, and now they're putting in a reserve for 1.4 million, so that is 2.2 you know, 2.1 million of the 2.2 that was requested. And the other piece, just as a reminder, is the hospitals really hold the reserve, the, the main part of the risk um, and would have to pay that out. Should they, you know, should we go into those risk corridors? Um, barring in 2019, when there are a couple hospitals that these guys are gonna cover if, if the worst case happens and we hit into those risk corridors. And that would be what they would have in for the, what they put in for 18 and 19 would fully cover the hospitals that they say they're going to protect. So um, just remember the hospitals are carrying the bulk of the $30 million risk if it happens where the reinsurance and the hospitals are supposed to pay that, not, you know, the ACO. Okay. That makes more sense to me. Okay. Other comments? Go ahead. Admit funds. Does that fit into this conversation anywhere where their administration costs? We didn't get the uh, first the part of what you said, Dale. The administra administration costs okay. that they have. I know, like the SASH discussion, what to do with administration funds. I keep trying to figure out. They. Like this morning, they were saying SASH services are covered in the ACO. But there was a budget cut elsewhere. Right. And I got budget cuts over there that are going to affect the services they're delivering. But when they do a presentation, they're saying, well, we got to cover. We're going to cover the services. There's a disconnect there in my mind. I can't. But so there might be in my mind too, because I took it that um, your services were going to be covered, but the, the cuts elsewhere might cut other services. Am yeah. I getting that wrong, Tom? No, I think that's right. And um, my understanding is that funding for SASH comes from two primary sources. One is now One Care, and that's from the Blueprint Replacement Funding. My understanding is that they also received funding through the state of Vermont that covered the bulk of their administrative operational costs, and that is the component that is um, in discussion to be cut. And they're looking for a way to uh, backfill that potential loss if that comes down. Well, and if it's helpful, the, in the negotiation, what Medicare was willing to fund was the cost of the services, which was, the, as Tom said, the $7.5 They don't fund admin. Medicare will not. So that was a cost that the state had to pick up um, because of federal re funding restrictions. But either way, the, the discussion at the legislature now doesn't impact the 2018 budget, which is what really we're here talking about today, the past budget. Yes. Um, but thank you. I just wanted to bring that up because I know that's going to be an issue going forward. So I wanted to point that out because if you want to talk with them over there and let them know what they are thinking may not be right. I think they might listen to you more than us. <laughs> I tried. Now, <laughs> to continue to. Uh, thank you. And that's my biggest fear is that everybody thinks that there's this vast pool that healthcare is going to pay for everything and that they can back away. That's just not the case. That, that's true. So, other. Yes, I am. Uh, I wonder if the board has, thought, has any thoughts at all in this in, in this area. Uh, if one of your one of the uh, hospitals involved here, the one here, goes into chapter eleven, what happens? It, it could happen. I think it, it's a, a smaller piece. But Tom, have you done any uh, modeling on what could happen on that? 
You know, we're, we, we haven't specifically. Um, I think this is one where we just need to wait to see what information comes out and then react based on that information. And we can speculate about different scenarios right now, but I'm not sure that does much uh, in terms of productively moving this forward. But based on the current modeling, wouldn't you owe them money? For 2018, they are mo they're, all hospitals are modeled as receiving some shared savings and my current modeling suggests they're all net winners, meaning that after their participation fees as cost to them, plus the population health receipts that they get and their performance in these two-sided risk programs, that they're all what I call net winners. So isn't the bigger question, and we don't have the answer for this, Ham, is how will the attributed lives be treated if there is a bankruptcy filing? Some would argue that the attributed lives wouldn't be affected because the hospital would continue on under the protection of the court. There could be others that might argue differently. Um, but you don't see this as a significant threat to your organization, do you? I do not. Okay. Other questions or comments from the public? Again, quiet day. So, um, Tom, we will schedule this um, for a vote on the afternoon of March 13th. We are opening it up for public comment today for anybody that wishes to um, comment on the issue. And uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. So with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.